Hello, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to the 25th episode of Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, King Louis the Twelfth. We. This is going to be a good one. Oh, excellent. Good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one because he's one of these people I know bits of, but not the whole story. We're not going to cover the whole story. Right. But yes, we'll get into that. First off, we want to start with a message to thank our brand new Patreon subscriber, Dark Lady M. Ooh. She has joined us. Thank <laughs> you very much. We really appreciate your support. And while we're on the subject of Patreon, I think the episode, stroke episodes of Giovanni Pico della Mirandola is, uh, should be out by now. I love it when you speak Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I love the accent. Yes, we have started cameo episodes. No, that's the ma- Patreon. Oh, that's the Patreon, mm-hmm. but we've also started cameo yes. episodes. Um, he, yeah, he's going to be an interesting character. He's got a very interesting philosophy on life, and that's what I was going to, to sort of home in on. But it also turns out he also has a very interesting life and knows lots of very charismatic and icon, I, icon, iconic. Iconic. What happened to my words today? Iconic <laughs> figures like uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent and Savonarola. Oh. So it's going to be a bit similar to Leonardo in that it was sort of Leonardo and Ludovico Sforza. And this one is going right. to be Pico and Savonarola, because without Savonarola, you don't really understand what Pico's up to. So it'd be a, right. a double bill again. And that should be out by the time this comes out. Fantastic. Mm. And Lorenzo is actually a de Medici, isn't he? Yes, he is. Okay. And he's an interesting character as well. I was very tempted yeah. to sort of veer off towards him, and I thought, no, nope. <laughs> no, nope, we can make him his own <laughs> yes. episode because there is a ton of stuff on Lorenzo. There's even a really good uh, documentary mm. about him and his wife. Ah, I didn't yeah. mention the wife at all in the books I was reading, but then it was about him and Pico. Ah, mm. okay. So if you fancy that, become a patron. Yes, please do. Mm-hmm. Well. I guess we have to do the quiz. We do. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, because last, last time I it completely slipped my mind. and then you... <laughs> Okay, now I must admit that not all of these, this is all about the um, Cornish Rebellion. Cornish Rebellion. Not all of them are yes. about uh, Angoff and Flamanc, because okay. although we got to know them at the beginning a little bit. There wasn't a lot on and them. And at the end, we found out what happened to them, but there was quite a big... And Goff and Flamanc shaped holes in the middle. Yes. <laughs> so I... That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so number one. Mm-hmm. Which two people in Henry's court did Angoff and Flamanc blame for their tax problems? Well, all their problems. Oh, Bray had to be Reginald Bray. Yeah. And... Oh, come on. Um, Cardinal. Cardinal. Yeah. Cardinal... Morton? Yes. Yep. Well done. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Two. What problem did Angoff and Flamanc hit when they got when they got to Exeter? Oh, that was the one where they wouldn't let them go through the city. So they've negotiated for the leaders to go through the city and the rest of the rabble to go around yes, the city. Traipse through the countryside. Yeah, well I done. I don't understand why they didn't just all go around. Like, why did you have to negotiate? They were making a point. <laughs> Why did uh, number three? Why did they make a detour to Kent? Because it was a hell of a detour, and it wasn't successful. Um, because Kent had always been into insurrections. Yeah, they could yep, they th- steal people. They thought that the Kent- Kentish people would join in. Yeah, steal people. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't. They could get more people. <laughs> but they didn't. Sadly, no. Well, I say sadly, it's probably just as well for them. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. What did Lord Dobney do during the battle that was rather foolish? I Foolish? Hmm. Foolhardy, he got, I say. Well, he got taken by the rebels. He did. That's right. And then they let him 
go. And he started fighting again. But the, yeah, the reason it was foolish is because he ran on ahead. He got overexcited oh, and sort of and left his troops and, and hurtled off. And yes. Right. Half a point. <laughs> <laughs> and number five, what was Lord Audley apparently dressed in when he was taken to Tower Hill to be beheaded? I have no idea. Mm, you'll kick yourself. Armour oh. of torn paper. Oh, right. Yes. yes. Apparently. I it's... thought for sure you were going to ask me for the giant's name. <laughs> I was. <laughs> it did cross my mind. Full star. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I didn't because I thought, well, she won't remember that. But you obviously do. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one of the things that sort of sticks in your brain. Like, okay, so they made up a giant named Bolster and he was in love with St. Agnes. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just... uh, Hilary Mantel who put the two bits together. <laughs> <laughs> well done. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, what five, four and, three and a half? half? No, <laughs> four three and, and a half. Four and a half, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that's better. I'll so. take four and a half. Yeah, I think so, more or less. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot the torn paper. Hmm. Weird. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Off to France On then. To Louis. Come with me, if you will. It's early November. You're not doing 15th. this in French then. Uh, no. no. And uh, I'm going to attempt to do French accents, but I, I will put in the caveat. In BC specifically, they teach you how to read and write it. They don't really teach you how to speak or <laughs> I think I can listen to it and understand it, but speaking isn't a great big part of the degree here. Same with high school. You don't really have time that you sit around talking. I don't know why. All right. Okay. But yeah. I will do my best, especially since it turns out that quite a bit of the accents have changed. So I went with the original okay. 1514 accent. All right. Well, no one, can, no one can pick you up on that then, can they? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And I looked at it and I'm like, wait a second. Some of the accents, like the accent aigu and accent grave, are, are in different spots mm. in the old 1500s. It's interesting to different see stresses. that even... The slight pronunciations have changed over time. I found that really fascinating. Mm. I don't know why. It's almost like they had a vowel shift. Yes. It's... But they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's wondering about the vowel shift, at some point, uh, English went through quite a big vowel shift. So what you're reading with the letters in the 15 and 1400s is pronounced that completely different than what it is now. Yeah, from what I can gather, there was a big vowel shift in sometime in the Middle Ages. And then at the early yeah. 16th century, there was another eruption. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it's very different. Like the mm. Y completely changed. It used to be the vowel I. Mm. And now it's got its own sound to it. Yeah, it is different. And it does make it quite a challenge to read. <laughs> <laughs> Come with me, if you will. It is early November 1514. You are a young daughter of a baroness, and you are so fortunate. You've been chosen to attend Princess Mary Tudor to France, along with your good friend, Anne Boleyn. Mm -hmm. The two of you are riding behind several other girls and ladies who themselves are behind the soon-to-be queen. She is already a queen. They had a marriage by proxy but we're about to do it again. As you enter Paris, you marvel at a pageant unlike you have ever seen before. God is above the street in a cloud. How on earth is he above the street in a cloud? You can't see any wooden structures holding him up. He is holding a large heart that is encompassed in the badge of the king's order. In the other hand, he holds a lily and a rose, and they're intertwined. You whisper to Anne, asking what it means. She gives you a disdainful look and says, Silly, it is the French lily and the English rose united, and then laughs. But with how old the king is, it won't last that long. Well, Anne doesn't come out of this very well, does she? <laughs> <laughs> the mentions of her during this point in time were... 
a little um, condescending to the other girls. We won't go too much into that because Anne Boleyn got her own episode with Rex Factor, but we may want to cover a bit more of her younger life in Claude's household, in Mary's household, and uh, she also went to Margaret of Savoy, which All would right. be very interesting. Mm. I keep coming and across that her. Yeah, it wasn't covered in Rex Factor, but she popped up all over the place in France when uh, Mary was married to Louis. It was quite interesting. So I don't know if we want to add her in the Henry VIII season. Either that or she might just appear so often that we feel we know her by by the end. I don't know. We'll see see, see how it goes. (laughs) Yes. On to Louis XII. Like other monarchs, we're focusing on the interactions that Louis had with the world that affected England specifically. We are not going to cover his entire life. And one of the reasons for that is we are encouraging you that when the our brother-sister podcast, Battle Royale, reaches Louis XII, they'll go, I hope, much more in-depth because he had a very, very active life. And it was really interesting, actually. I was quite impressed. <laughs> one thing we will not cover... I'm sorry, Lucy. I couldn't find why he was called Tiny Head. (laughs) Nothing at all. Well, that Venetian chronicler said he has a tiny head. There's so little room for brains. So I think (laughs) it was that part of it they were probably getting at more than physically having a tiny head. (laughs) Yes, but I think it was just because the Venetian chronicler was just very mad at some of his actions Mm. (laughs) rather than a physical, (laughs) uh, I don't know, deformation maybe for the tiny head. But yes. So if our listeners do not know, Battle Royale is another podcast in the Rex Factor family that is covering the French monarchy. Check them out. That being said, I will have to cover a bit of background information at the beginning or why the later interactions with England will occur will make no sense whatsoever. We begin with his birth, and of course, we have a very accurate date for Louis's birthday. He was born in the evening of June 27th, 1462, possibly 6 or 7 p.m. Yeah, they often knew that, didn't they? Because they wanted to do birth charts and things, didn't they, for their... Yes, yes. France was huge into astrological charts. Mm. So they needed the actual time. The reason I say 6 or 7 p.m., is because the medieval calendar, which they were still using for time clocks, were different. Right. You spent more hours in the day and fewer hours in the evening, and that was due to the church doing prayers on every hour. So it was weird. I ended up on this yet another rabbit hole (laughs) and introducing yet again the follet which was a device that would be able to squish the hours of time during the day and then extend them in the evening. So you would have, in the summer, the summer hours got longer. Yeah. So an hour was closer to what we think of an hour. But during the winter, because the day was so short, in some cases, the hour was only half an hour long. Yeah. So you'd end up with a ton of hours in the day, and then in the evening, you'd end up with four or five hours only during the dark. That way the monks didn't have to get up every hour and disturb their sleep to do the prayers every hour. Oh, that's very sensible, isn't it? They're quite pragmatic, (laughs) aren't they, these people who claim to do everything purely for the spiritual reasons? Yes, we will do it every single hour, but... (laughs) Yes, but we're making the hours 24 hours long. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, exactly. I thought that was hilarious. Mm. So, yes, he may have been 6 or 7 p.m., but because the time clocks were different, we don't actually know which one it was. His father, Charles of Orléans, was 68. So there's a little bit of scandal around his conception, possibly. That's old for that time, isn't it? That is very Mm. old. People would be slightly askance now, wouldn't they? But certainly then, you were a very, very old man. Extremely (laughs) old. There was quite a bit of speculation from Louis XI, the universal spider, mm-hmm. and I will be calling him the spider for the rest of this, otherwise we'll get very confused between the two Louis. <laughs> yep, good. That Charles was in no way capable of intimacy due to his health. The spider even said, and we have a quote, as feeble and as poisoned as he is, he has still made his wife pregnant? What, is there a question mark at the end of that, or...? 
Did yes. You, right. So, well, kind of a question mark, kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hey, he. There's no way. Yeah. And the poison. But he does he that refer- sort of thing, doesn't he? He loves to sort of sneak it back. When he said that uh, Philip was a girl. Yes. He loves to sort of. T- like the blue touch paper and then just see what happens, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> like, mm. sit back and watch. <laughs> <laughs> the poison he referred to was due to the fact that Charles was believed he was being poisoned by Francesco Sforza. A Sforza, eh? No, yeah. they don't do that sort of thing. No, not <laughs> at all. But I mean, yet another interesting connection. You don't think yeah. of Sforza and Charles being there together, especially since Charles spent a lot of his time in prison in the Tower of London. Charles had been unable to sire an heir prior to this age because he had been held in the Tower of London as a hostage after the Battle of Agincourt. Oh, good heavens. We're, we're really scanning a, a, quite a lot of centuries here. Aren't yes. We? <laughs> Yeah, it was fantastic. If we've got him in Agincourt and then we've got Anne Boleyn, yes. it just seems to be completely different ages. Yeah, it really does. In your head, they are, like, mm. there's a dead line there. But yes, Battle of Agincourt. Good heavens. And that was in 1413. And he was not ransomed until November 5th, 1440. Well, let's hope he was in a nice place, not where poor Perkin ended up. <laughs> yes and no. He started oh. off really well. But that's 27 years. 27, 27 years, years being held as a hostage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So no wife. He had plenty of mistresses. <laughs> Apparently there are some... Um, what, in the Tower of London? Yeah. Hmm. Everything's laid on, isn't it? Well, he got to come out quite often, apparently, because he was the Duke of Orléans. He was a prize to be... What shall we say? The flaunted. Put out on stage? Yeah. Yes, flaunted. Very good <laughs> word. I couldn't think of a word. Yes, we have quite a few dukes from Agincourt that are hanging around London, which I didn't think about during the War of the Roses at all. No, no, you think of Agincourt as being an entirely separate, much, much yeah. earlier event. But there were several dukes that were still there because of the amount of money that was being required for their ransom. <laughs> really interesting. On his release, so 27 years later, mm. he was married to 14-year-old, mm. yet another connection, Mary of Cleves, mm. grand aunt to Anne of Cleves, Anne. Mm-hmm, who married Henry VIII. Yeah. Yeah. 14, though. <laughs> yep. He was 46. <sighs> and, yeah, 14. Ugh. Mm. It was 17 years... Sorry? Poor little mite. Yeah. It seemed quite common for royalty. Mm. And Mary of Cleves was considered royalty because at that point, Cleves was still a principate. So he was a prince of the German Republic. I think principate is the right word. Trying to remember. Principality? Principality? It was a sovereign area Mm. for the Holy Roman Empire, so he was one of the princes. They ended up becoming dukes later, like they were dropped down. Uh, It was 17 years before they had a child, and the first was a girl, Marie. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to say, just as well, really, if she's only 14, but actually that is quite a a length of time. (laughs) Yeah, which leads to more speculation as why they didn't get pregnant earlier. Perhaps there wasn't a third party earlier. (laughs) Possibly. Five years later, they conceived again, and this time it was the son that they had hoped for, Louis. Hmm. Even though there were stated doubts about the legitimacy, no person ever brought a legal claim that he was illegitimate, even though he was third in line to the throne after Louis XII and Charles. Hmm. The Universal Spider's younger brother, not his son at this point. The Universal Spider doesn't have a son. So it's Louis, the spider's younger brother, Charles, and then Louis. Mm. And Louis hated the Orléans. If there was a possibility Louis of him spider. not being... The spider, sorry. Yeah. Yes, the spider. If there was a possibility of him not being a legitimate heir, I can't see the spider leaving that alone. No. I mean, he's already made the, made the comment. You'd have thought he would have followed it up. If he was convinced, yeah. Yeah. 
Mm. You can see he doesn't like him in the future because of his treatment of Louis. But the fact that he never went to court to have him... He didn't even have to go to court. All he had to do was a proclamation. Mm. He was the king. He could disinherit him with a word and a signed document. But then and he who, never did. But then who would have been after that? Maybe that was someone even worse. Possibly. It would have gone to the next Valois family. I'm not sure. I know where it goes after Louis the Twelfth passes away, but I don't I didn't look mm. at who would have gone to after Charles. Hmm. Anyway. Louis was put under his mother's guardianship when his father died when he was two years old. He was very old. Yeah. (laughs) Mary had been raised in the Burgundian court, and she imbued their chivalric and decadent mores into Louis, even though they were pretty poor. I don't know where she got the money to be flamboyant at certain times, but... One of the things she was known to do was provide him with a single outfit that matched his ducal level mm-hmm. or status. That's a better word. But the rest of the time, those clothes were kept away and he had to wear commoner's clothes. All right. And he resented it. Yeah. Yes, because they could not afford. So she was ready to put on the display when it was public. The rest of the time, they just didn't have the money. There's so many poverty-stricken rulers knocking around, aren't there? Yeah. Well, the reason they were so poor is that all of the lands had to be mortgaged to pay the ransom of his father Charles to England. (laughs) And the spider was so stingy with their allowance into regard to what their rank should have been allotted, he is part or third in line to the throne Mm. and in french law they are given an allowance it is requirement you have to uphold the status of the monarchy by upholding the status of each member that is in line to the throne but presumably it's up to the up to the monarch to decide how much on the allowance yes there was a dictated amount that was supposed to be part of it but the spider said no so he was incredibly stingy. So by, while being raised within a, within a decadent ideal of chivalry and status and pomp and circumstance, he was also raised to be very frugal, which is quite the conundrum. He must have been so frustrated if he's, if he's having this sort of dangled in front of him. This is what life could be like. And yes. this is what life is like. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good luck to you. <laughs> Louis was, of course, trained for his rank. That was required. So he was included, his, sorry, his training included war and strategy, hunting, Latin, diplomacy, all of that. And it's funny how the two main biographers, Frederick Baumgartner and Bernard Quillet, both imply while his education was provided... Louis refused to be taught. If anything didn't interest him, he just left. (laughs) He didn't stick around for the lessons. He just wandered off. Well, there we are. That's why he's got no brains. That's why. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) The Venetians were right. (laughs) It wasn't a total loss for his education. He did learn Latin very well for some reason. That was, I don't know. Must have interested him. Yeah, it did. Mm. It was almost an obsession later for him. He really enjoyed Latin and reading the ancient histories. Ancient history was one of his interests to the point where he went out and sought more books to learn about ancient history. Well, I suppose that that's quite chivalric, isn't it? All um, yeah, Caesar and Alexander and people. That's someone to emulate. He was actually more interested in Greek history All right. than Roman history. And music as well. He played very many instruments. He was well known for singing and playing constantly. (laughs) I know someone like that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I wonder if he made it. It doesn't say that he built his own instruments like your husband (laughs) does. But he played quite a bit. He was a very successful jouster as a young man, but did not joust after becoming king because of the danger. Mm. They were very strict at not letting him continue in tournaments after he became king, which 
In the future, you would wish that Catherine de' Medici's husband, King Francis II, followed that example because he died in a jousting match. Well, and Henry VIII. I mean, he was badly injured, yes. wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. And too bad that his guardians were not, or his council were not a bit more forceful with that. In 1476, Louis was married to Jeanne of France, the daughter of the Universal Spider and Charlotte of Savoy. He was 14. She was two years younger than he was. This doesn't mean that they were living together mm. or consummating because technically she was of the right age, but yeah, very young. They were also second cousins once removed. So they had to get a papal dispensation. Yes. Well, everybody did, didn't they? We discovered. <laughs> yep. Very easy. There is some date in the logic behind this marriage. Jeanne was deformed. And Jeanne uh, translates to Joan mm. in English. She was deformed and crippled. And the physicians told the spider that she would most likely be sterile. Though we don't know if he was aware of the fact when the marriage was proposed. She was only four days old when this marriage was arranged. Oh, dear. There's no way to tell at that point. But he insisted on the betrothal being renewed in 1473. So we still have a betrothal that's not the marriage. They're below the canonical age allowed for an actual marriage. And this is the spider insisting. Yes. Mm. And in 1473, her deformities and sterili sterility were known by this time. And Louis the spider now had an heir apparent in his son, Charles, who was born three years prior so um, was this to prevent Louis the Twelfth from making a dynasty? Yeah, that's what the yeah. the argument is. Mm. Two things: one, it would link him to the royal household because he was now married; he was the brother-in-law to the heir apparent. The hope was because they would never have children, it wouldn't continue a rival family. Mm. That's the thought. It's not nice to use your very sick daughter in that way is it yes mm. yes in case anybody's wondering she was born with one leg very much shorter than the other a hunchback and possible dwarfism right but if you want to know more she... about her join patreon and you could vote for her she's one of the four <laughs> oh the vote will be closed by oh. now oh well by you might be time. able to hear about her or you might not depending on who's been voted for Yes, but if not, she will come up again because we are going to mm. start recycling people that people didn't choose the first time. Recycling, that sounds horrible. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> ah. But Jeanne was incredibly intelligent. She was very intelligent. It's possible that she focused more on education rather than the physical because she could not dance. She couldn't do those kinds of things. Mm. It might be something to throw yourself into as well, isn't it? Um, yeah. Especially since you had access to the library in France. Mm. And they, the spider had a very great library. Not all his own books, of course. <laughs> it would have been collected over the centuries. But she had plenty to be able to read. She was also excessively kind. The poor woman put up with so much. Yeah, every time I've come across her, it says that she was nice but ugly, it always said. Yes, yeah. <laughs> nice but not very good looking. Mm. Unfortunately, Louis had heard very often about her deformities and, shall we say, unpretty appearance and was not happy about the marriage. Well, presumably he'd have heard about the sterility as well, won't he? I mean, how do they keep that away from him? It doesn't say. Hmm. It doesn't say. And I'm not sure about the sterility, if that was bandied about very much. I don't know if the doctors just told the spider that, hmm. because I only found that in the spider's biography. I didn't find it in Louis XII's, really. It was slightly mentioned that the spider knew about it, but it doesn't say anything about the court being informed. Or oh, well, maybe after the ceremony, the spider went up to Louis and said, by the way, she's sterile, and then ran away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just laughed in his face and didn't leave. <laughs> Too late. Yeah. The only reason that Louis and his mother agreed to the marriage is that the spider threatened both Louis and his mother that he would throw Louis in the river sewn into a sack. That would do it. 
Yeah. That's so, quite okay. convincing. Yeah. Marry this lady or die. I'll take the marriage. And would he have done it or was that just a, a sort of idle threat? With the spider, yes. Uh, I could very much see him doing that. Hmm. Very much so. I've read his biography. Mm -hmm. He's not a nice guy. I want somebody to vote her because she also become later becomes a Catholic saint. So what a life. Mm. Born, deformed, married to possibly a future king, treated horribly, and then become a Catholic saint. Later, after Louis had seized Jean, he again protested the marriage, but the spider threatened to put him in a monastery for his life if he did not marry her. Well, it's getting less, getting less threaty, but... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, quite a lot of people chose the monastery, but very few people choose to be sewn into a sack and lobbed in the river. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you're thinking he's a teenager at this point and he knows that celibacy was required in the monks. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't see him doing that either. No. Because of the consanguinity, one of our regular supporting cast, Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere. Oh, yes. Or della Rovera. I, I'm not as good at those names. <laughs> Came to France with the dispensation not only for the familial relationship, familial relationship, but also for the spiritual relationship. Rabbit hole alert. Okay. <laughs> Got to find a sound for that. Yes. <laughs> this is where I learned that godparents in the eyes of the Catholic Church became literal parents to the child as if they were a blood relation. Right. So if your godparents... You are now the mother or father of that child, according to the Catholic Church. Well, that just extends this, this <laughs> consanguinity even further, doesn't it? I mean, it just sucks everybody in. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Especially when you consider that some royalty had five or six godparents. Yeah, well, even Leonardo, had he had about ten, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Hedging their bets in case somebody dies, there's always Which a godparent. They do. But Which they do. now you're the you're the child of ten people. Mm. Well, I suppose yes, because the parents might well die as well. You've, at least they've got something that they know, someone that they know will look after the children after they've gone. Yes. Mm. So, in an attempt to keep the spider friendly, Louis's father Charles had asked him to be the godfather of Louis. Oh, right. So he's now the father-in-law and the father, effectively. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So according to church law, Louis and Jean were brother and sister. Mm. This just gets nicer and nicer, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No problem in getting that dispensation, though. No. Of course. We have money. Money, money, money. Yes. At the wedding, unfortunately, poor Jean. Poor Jean. When asked if Louis would take Jean to be his wife, mm. Louis told the bishop that he was being forced to. And she's standing there next to him. Yes, he never said yes, ever. He just kept repeating that he was being coerced, that he was being forced, and that he was being threatened to take her. Eventually, the bishop proceeded anyway <laughs> because he wasn't getting a yes. Well, yeah, otherwise he'd be sewn into a sack and thrown in the river. Exactly. Mm. Technically, that should have ended the marriage. Church law still required that both parties were willing and had to agree to the marriage at the ceremony. And Louis never did. Well, I suppose that's a useful get-out clause, should he need Later. one. <laughs> yes. The bishop proceeded as fast as possible and then ran out of the church. We actually have statements of him hustling out of the church Almost running. I can imagine the car outside with the door open and me jumping in and <laughs> wow as he goes. Get off. me out of here. I don't want to be here. At the poor oh, at the celebration of the wedding afterwards, we have reports of Louis sobbing oh, and refusing to eat or even acknowledging that Jean was beside him. Well they're both miserable, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. We have the reverse situation of Catherine here. Louis insisted the marriage had not been consummated. And what did Jean, Jean say? And Jean said it was. So later we've got Catherine of Aragon saying it hadn't been consummated. Mm. And King Henry saying it had. Here we have the man saying, I didn't touch her. Yes. 
And Jean's saying, yes, yes, it was consummated, but there were no wet witnesses. Do you, she was very young. Would she have yes. known exactly what was involved, do you think? Well, they had waited till she was 14, mm. but I don't honestly know. I mean, how much sex education was there? <laughs> the matron of honor was supposed to tell them what happened. But we, we don't really ever have a record of those conversations. Mm. So we can't say, yes, it did happen or no, it didn't. I would hope it did. Could you imagine going into that? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are, we doing? What are you doing? <laughs> yes. yes. What's that? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Whether or not it was consummated, it was obviously not successful. Louis fled from her. He left the home he and Jean were supposed to share and ran back to his mother. Hmm. I wonder what mum thought about all this. She was not happy with the wedding, so I'd imagine she just welcomed him back. But he was forced to go back under threat from the spider. Again, you will be killed if you don't go back to my daughter. Mm. Yeah, not a happy situation. No, no, indeed. His interactions with Jean totally lost him points, in my opinion of him. He was cruel in speech to her. He neglected her it, to the point where he refused to be in a room with her at any time. And he just full dismissal of her and her feelings. Hmm. I suppose he was completely swamped in his own feelings, wasn't he? And never thought to think yeah. that, what, how does she feel about this? But at the same time, mm. you could still be kind. Like, we haven't come across a lot of kindness, have we, in, no. in this last year, <laughs> year a bit? <laughs> kindness does not appear to be something that is taught to medieval people no. in Tudor era. I think that's why when we came across Leonardo and it said, oh, come to, you know, go to him with your problems and things, you think, my yeah. God, the man's a saint. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just because he's relatively Probably decent. <laughs> <laughs> Jean, on her side, though, was extremely patient and extremely kind. She even stayed up with him not sleeping when he was ill. She may have come across this attitude from everybody throughout her entire life, mustn't she? I suppose so. I don't know what it's like being disabled and and you're praying that your kindness would in turn get kindness mm. i don't know during the first years of their marriage louis was completely taken up in the pursuit of pleasure and by that i mean sports music hunting and of course mistresses loads and loads of mistresses mm. well yeah it's not unknown <laughs> no it was very common in fact it was uncommon for people not to have mistresses. That's why Henry the Seventh, being so faithful to his wife was commented on mm. so much. That really does boost it boost him in my estimations. I mean there's a lot to, yeah. to push him back down again, but <laughs> But the fact that he was faithful yes. to his wife for think... the entire time. Mm. Yep. Some people forgive Louis for the fact that he did not, after all, consider his marriage valid. He did not say yes to it. He never said, I do. He didn't want it. I mean, it's... No. He made that perfectly clear, didn't he? But then he goes back down because he was not covert in his affairs. He brought them home. Hmm. And he didn't limit himself to aristocratic women. He kept a commoner mistress in his home, and his accounts show payments to les filles aux joies. Mm, yeah, I've come across that phrase, yes. Yeah, literally translated to girls of joy. Mm. It, the other translation is prostitute. Yeah. At this point in time, it was just mistresses, but later it would become the term for working girls and prostitutes. But most likely at this time, it means mistresses. There is a bit of debate on whether or not it was also referring to prostitutes, but they, they ended up in his budget. You wouldn't have thought somebody of his um, standing Frank. would need to go to prostitutes. But then again, some sometimes people of exceptionally high standing they like a bit of rough, don't they? Like a bit of low yes. life. So. The other possibility is he still was not getting his regular allowance, so perhaps he couldn't afford a proper mistress. Mm, that's true. Prostitutes were cheaper. Yep. 
Mm, we go down some interesting dark alleys on this this podcast, don't we? Yes, we do. Sorry, <laughs> which which is more which is more cost effective, a prostitute or a mistress? <laughs> <laughs> If it's an aristocratic mistress, it's definitely a prostitute because yeah. the aristocratic mistress would demand a specific amount of money. And she'd probably want a, a residence of her own. Yes. And a retinue and the whole business. Uh, yeah. And servants mm. and gardeners and you name it. It was very convoluted and I found it really odd. Like Now we think this lifestyle of pleasure and maintaining multiple women is repugnant. Mm. I mean, especially in consideration of the feelings of the woman you're married to. Mm. In this period in France, it was not only considered normal for a nobleman to have this behavior, but it had the opposite effect of what you would think. Now, the more women you bedded, the more of a man you were. Mm. Technically, that's still going on today. Yeah. You just have to think of the way women, if they have multiple partners, are considered... I don't want to say the word, mm -hmm. but we'll bleep it out. Whereas men are considered virile and, oh, look at how many women he's getting. It's the same, but back then it was even more pronounced. If you didn't have a mistress, there was something wrong with you. And there was quite a bit to talk about uh, being impotent if you didn't have mistresses. I'm trying to remember. There was a king. How, hang on. I think it was James II who had ugly mistresses. He liked them big yes. and ugly. <laughs> and he... And he used to go and didn't they go and make collages together or something? He didn't really want a mistress. He just liked going. Wasn't that George the First? I don't know. I can't remember, but I just remember there was one of them who was sort of coerced into having a mistress. Uh, so, so we figured if I have to have one, I'll take these two. I'll, I'll have this one, and we'll go and play cards and read a book. And do, I'm sure it's something about doing collages <laughs> together, and it all yeah, sounded quite pleasant I'm... and sweet and. He didn't want a mistress, really. I'm almost positive that's George the First. He brought uh, one of his cousins who was fat. Yeah, because the women of the court started eating a ton of food, trying to gain his... <laughs> they. I remember comments about them splitting out of their clothing in an attempt to gain the king's love. Because they assumed that since both of his mistresses, well, no, he had one fat and ugly and one skinny and ugly, <laughs> but he spent more time with the fat one. So all the aristocratic women would eat and try to get bigger because the king liked fat women. At least that's what they thought was. Well, he just liked that fat woman. He didn't like them in general. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, lovely lot. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing with his pleasure-seeking entire lifestyle was that he ended up endearing himself to the other young noblemen because he'd bring them along with him not necessarily to the mistresses but the jousting the drinking the partying because he was always there everybody liked him hmm. and it developed a loyalty that would last his entire lifetime with the nobles that were with him yeah i can imagine that if you've been together since you were all very young it's much better than having some austere someone who doesn't join in yeah, standoffish, yeah. whereas he was very much into that and spent quite a bit of time with his younger counterparts. And also he was obviously trying to keep away from the missus, wasn't he? Yes. Poor, poor Jean. Hmm. The political scene in Louis' younger days was largely focused on the political wrangling and assassinations between the monarchs of France and the Dukes of Burgundy. Okay. Yes. Louis used this to his advantage. He was of the royal line of Orléans, but also his mother was raised at the Burgundian court and had very many friends there still. Mm. The ruling house was the Valois, and the Valois and the Burgundian dukes were also a member of the royal of, line of France. So the Burgundian dukes were also within that royal line that could claim the throne. They were much farther down, but they were bitter rivals because the dukes felt that they should be princes and treated as such. That's part of the problem. And then, of course, the kings of France were just saying, no, we are the kings, you are a duke, and you need to do homage to us. And it, it never went well. Yeah, there's no benefit Ever to a king well. to bump them up to princes, is there? No, and the Burgundians were always feeling like they were trying to be taken over and being pushed aside and did not have any say, mm. which they didn't. 
So, again, entitlement. Entitlement is causing an issue. In 1483, Louis's life became more important to the country. Charles VIII, 13 years old, succeeded his father to the throne. So the spider's son is now on the mm. throne. He had no children, of course. He's 13. And the spider's brother had passed away as well. So now there's just him next in line to the throne. He is the heir presumptive. So there's a difference between an heir apparent and an heir presumptive. Heir apparent is the eldest boy of the father. Mm. So he's automatically that. Heir presumptive is when there is no heir apparent who is the next person in line due to rank. So that's what Louis is now. He's the heir presumptive. Unfortunately, Louis is 21 and Charles is 13. And Louis has been cavorting with a whole bunch of noblemen around his age. 13 requires a regency. Louis seems like the better choice. And especially hmm. since Charles VIII was considered simple and weak. He had some deformity as well, I think, didn't he? Wasn't he a hunchback yes, he or did. something? Yes, he did. He was, he did have deformities not as deformed. He was still able mm. to ride, do everything you're supposed to do, but not well. He was in no way robust. He was known to have a very slight and delicate frame. Apparently, some people were worried that a wind could break him. I don't know exactly what that means in appearance, but that doesn't sound good for a king. No. Mind you, some 13-year-olds are a bit sort of thin and gangly, aren't they? And then they fill out. Yeah, because you're growing so fast, you can't put Later. on the weight. Mm. He had not received, this will give you an indication of how weak and simple he was, he did not receive mm -hmm. a very good education because his father, the spider, thought it would be too much for his constitution to handle. He thought he would die if he gave him too much education. Hmm. I don't see the logic in that, but... Neither do I. No. He felt his mind couldn't take it. So he thought he was actually simple-minded, as they would have said. Uh, well... As well as bodily weak. His fears could be considered justified. Charles was regularly fighting bad fevers. And when the fevers weren't bothering him, it was colds that he couldn't kick. He was incessantly and almost continuously ill. So he's got a bad immune system. Yes. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. In France, the age of majority for a king is 14. Can you imagine that? You're 14 and now you get to rule the country without a regency council or anything. Terrifying. Yes. Yeah. I know when I was 14, I did not make the best decisions. So Charles needed a regent. The spider had seen this power play in the future. Of course he did. He was, I think we are going to probably do an episode on him. He comes way before Henry, but he's a very, very devious character. He's more devious than Henry VII was. I know. I mean, to get the nickname the Universal Spider. Yeah. In a an age that is full of devious people. I mean, that's got to be a whole new level of deviousness, isn't it? Yes. So we might do a special episode on him. I'd love to. So I probably just will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, special episodes aren't aren't um, held in by all our rules that we've got for yes, the normal episodes. Exactly. You can do what you like then. The yeah. rules go out the window. <laughs> Okay, so he saw this power play, and instead of choosing a single person to be regent, he decided to select a council, which included Louis, but would be presided over Pierre de Beaujeu. Pierre was also named Guardian of Charles, and if you're wondering who he is and why he has this ability... Isn't he? Is he the one that's married to his, his sister? Charles's older sister, yes. Yeah. Yes. I thought the name rang a bell somewhere. So she was an Anne, I think, wasn't she? Anne of France? Anne of France. Like oh, Anne right. de France. <laughs> uh, who is now known as Anne de Beaujou. In reality, the Regency was ruled by Anne. There is a lot of commentary about how she really should have been king. Everybody followed her rules. So when we're talking about women not being paid attention to, somehow she managed to be the 
only person that was listened to on this council. Mm. And I don't know how she did it. Like, that must have been such an iron will. And there is, again, quite a bit of information about her. It is before our time period. But it would be interesting to do an episode on her just because of the iron fist she held France in for so long. Well, she must have been the one that said to Henry Tudor, come over to France because, you know, it's too dangerous in Brittany when he left all of a sudden. Yep. And everyone said, oh, it's, he went over to Charles's court. Well, it wasn't really Charles's court at that point, was no, it? No, it wasn't. It was hers. It was still Anne's. Mm. Even though it's years later, she still ruled. Even when Charles was out of his minority, Anne was still in charge. And that's what later is claimed by Louis for why he will rebel. Right. Spoiler alert, in a few minutes we'll be talking about his rebellion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anne was, of course, the king's eldest sister. Louis attempted various methods to remove them, Anne and Pierre, or at least reduce their power in the council. So when nothing succeeded, he just turned to all and out rebellion. So not really a spoiler. It was pretty quick. And this was after after Charles had he was he wasn't in his minority anymore. It's still in his minority. Oh, still okay. And because of Louis's loyalty that he had built with all of those young nobles, who are now the powerful nobles, they're in their 20s, their 30s, Mm. um, he was able to bring up quite a big force against them. But the Beaujus retaliated and sent men to arrest Louis. And because they did manage to keep all the old guard on their side... Louis had no choice but to flee, and he immediately ran to Francis, the Duke of Brittany. Yeah, right. So Louis in Brittany as well. And we need to remember that this part of the Duchy of Brittany was politically against the French, but was Mm. also looking very kindly on Henry Tudor and had Henry Tudor there. Hmm. Henry and Jasper. Exactly. We don't know if Henry and Louis ever met, but my guess is they would because they both would have been guests of the Duke and would have been entertained by the Duke. Well, in this later part of Henry's stay in Brittany, he was sent to a rather austere looking tower, wasn't he? Yes. So whether he'd have been there and Louis might have been somewhere else, because he and Jasper were separated, weren't they? I think Yes, was... but this is very early on when mm. uh, Henry and Francis were very friendly. Mm. And Henry mm. was spending a great deal of time at the court, but I couldn't find a single snippet of evidence that they knew each other, that they had mm. met. I wish I did. Politically fighting the rule of the Beaujous, Louis proposed to the Breton Duke, also known as the Duke of Brittany, getting confusing, that he would have his marriage to Jean annulled, and Louis would prefer to marry the Duke's daughter Anne, if the Duke supported him. So this Hmm. is Anne of Brittany. Yes, who plays quite a pivotal role in all of this shenanigans. Yes, she does. Hmm. Duke Francis and Louis did come to an agreement regarding this. So he was going to marry Anne. He would have to have his marriage to Jean Annauld. How he was going to do that when the French king was going to, was his brother-in-law, I have no idea. And they together reached out to Maximilian of Habsburg and to Richard III for help. Hmm. Two lovely characters. Mm-hmm. Both promised aid. But in return, Richard made a demand. He demanded that the Duke Francis hand over Henry. I thought it it might be the one, yes. Yeah. And Maximilian, did he come up with anything or did he just promise things that never happened? He actually came up with money, did he? Yeah, he did send people. He sent people and money. I don't know where he got the money at this point because Henry's not funding him yet. (laughs) Uh, Long story short. Louis, we're not going to go too far into it because that's definitely something that Battle Royale will probably cover. Please, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Louis was able to return to France but continued to work against Anne de Beaujou. Henry was able to flee from Brittany before France took him or before Richard got him because uh, Duke Francis actually did like Henry. 
So he mm. just sort of turned a blind eye at this point and let he him wasn't very France. well i don't think at this point was he he, would, he no he had a stroke or something like not that. He yet he wasn't well that's i believe that's the next time because henry ends up back in Brittany. i don't know it's a little confusing august 1485 henry gains the english throne he does and also claimed the french throne so the French had then helped him from getting away from Brittany. He then goes back to Brittany. Then he comes back to France because they're back and forth. And every time somebody makes an agreement with Richard, he has to leave. But mm -hmm. he just goes back to the other person because Richard has now violated the agreement for the other person. <laughs> Richard, yeah. Richard was bouncing back and forth between supporting France and supporting Brittany. It always seemed a very difficult thing for Henry because he had been helped by both and yet... Once he got into power, he couldn't support both because they were right. at loggerheads. So which was he to choose? It seemed quite a tricky one. Well, the French had given up on him the most recently. So mm. I think Henry decided to just go against the French anyway, because he did claim the French throne. Mm. I don't know. I wonder if Charles was upset. Like you went against me and I saved you from Brittany. I don't know. And now you want my throne. <laughs> and now you want my throne. Because of this, Louis lost the aid of the English for his own claim to the French throne. So he had support from Richard III. We don't know if it's because Henry was claiming the French throne for himself, and that's why he abandoned Louis, or if it was because Louis agreed to give him up to Richard III. And that's why Henry was going against Louis. It's... We don't have a clear answer to that. It could be both. Hmm. We don't. I mean, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. F you wouldn't favor somebody who was just going to hand you over to a very, very uncertain future. Yes, most likely death. Hmm. Yeah. The peace between Louis and the French monarch. I say the French monarch because it could have been Charles. It could have been Anne. It's really hard to tell who is making the decisions right now. It seems like it was Anne. It didn't last long because he was back to conspiring. Anne was not giving him what he wanted. He wasn't having any say on the council. He was not able to get anything out of the council that he thought was his right, which was that allowance again in the lands that he should have access to. They weren't giving it to him. I wouldn't either after you had already held a rebellion against me. Why would I give you more power? Hmm. But we see this so often. All these people who are so high up, but they're just not quite high enough. Yes. And they resent it bitterly. They resent it more than as if, as if they had nothing. Yes. And hmm. an interesting aside here. Louis, in 1487, actually attempted at one point to negotiate with Anne and Charles to give up the Duchy of Orléans, to give up his duke claim hmm. to the king in return for an annulment from Charles's sister, John. Oh, God. <laughs> I dislike being married to her so much, I am willing to give up my rank, my title, and my lands to get it annulled. Hmm. What he doesn't tell them is that he would then marry Anne of Brittany. Hmm. <laughs> And why this is important is, well, Anne's still a child. She's about 10 or 11. But her father had already managed to guarantee, regardless of Salic law. Mm. And that is that, that no, there could be no queens on the French throne, only kings. Yes, yes. Well, it also was regarding most of the dukes and duchesses that were related to the crown. So since the Brittany dukes were related to the crown quite a while ago they were supposed to follow that salic law salic law mm. and he had managed to get it approved and in writing that anne would succeed him as duchess in her own right he didn't have a son so under normal circumstances, that duchy would be sent given back to the crown and the crown would then entitle somebody else, usually a member of their own family. Is that on the assumption that he probably would have a son, so it wouldn't go to Anne? No, he was already well past being able to have any kids. Oh, yes, sorry, I was thinking we were talking about Louis there, yes. Yeah, this is Duke Francis. Yes, Duke Francis. 
Yeah. So what Louis was actually doing, which was in the end part of it, was he would have to get her permission to marry Anne from the French king. But he was giving up Orléans to gain a different and larger duchy, and in his eyes, a much better wife. It's quite a... It's quite, it's quite a dodgy thing, though, isn't it? If you give up your duchy and then discover that something's gone wrong and Anne's died or... Yes. Yeah, it's quite a gamble. Yes, then you've got absolutely nothing. Mm. Because you wouldn't be able to consummate the marriage. She's 10 or 11. You wouldn't be able to consummate the marriage until she was 14. Mm. Well, technically 12, but most people waited, unlike Margaret Beaufort's. Not like Edmund, yeah. yeah. Louis again had to flee to Brittany because of this, and this time France invaded the duchy to get him. Louis only gave up on his desire for Anne when he had to again seek help from Maximilian uh-huh. and was forced to allow <laughs> Maximilian to attempt to arrange a marriage between himself and Anne. So he gave up Anne to Maximilian. So- so that's just to save, save himself. himself now. Yes. It's not, it's, it, there's no more political uh, maneuvering. No. It's literally just, he's just got to save yes. himself. Hmm. Anne in France had gotten an army together and sent them into the duchy to get Louis. Hmm. So they might as well claim territory while they're there. Yes. <laughs> Henry VII comes back in. He was asked for aid, but refused. He didn't come himself, but when he did... From Louis or from... From Louis and Maximilian. Mm. It appears to be Maximilian who pushes this, but Louis sent the request. Yeah. I I sometimes wonder what Louis was really willing to give up. At this point, is he just trying to save his life and giving up absolutely everything? Mm. But he then turned to Henry VII. Can you imagine that? Years earlier, you had basically agreed to have Henry VII executed by sending him back to Richard. And now you're like, by the way, can you help me? Hmm. I can't see that going over very well. Yeah, we, was, we were all so young then. It didn't matter, did it? But, uh, no. He's really messed up, hasn't he? He's messed yes. up big time. Shot himself he's, in the foot. He's taken what was a good prospect. Mm-hmm. And he's just chucked it all away. Yeah, because being married to Jean, we try to remember what's going on. He doesn't like Anne. Anne is working against him. However, he and Charles actually have a very good relationship, him and Charles VIII. Charles VIII admired him. It's Mm. like how Henry VIII had a crush on Philip. Mm. It seems that Charles VIII had a crush on Louis. And they were cousins. It's uh, maybe I've been reading too much about the uh, Italian courts, but you think just poison her. That's all you've got to do. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the easiest way to do this. <laughs> Henry himself also had a um, grudge to bear with France. He does invade France. He doesn't invade at this point, but what he does allow is 800 men under an unnamed English nobleman. I could not find who did it. To go to Brittany to help. Hmm. We do know... Oh, I think... Now, they're dredging this up from over a year ago when I was doing Jasper. and Wasn't it a Woodville? I believe so, but I couldn't mm. find anything recently and I didn't Edward want Woodville. to rely on my memory. <laughs> yeah. No, this is, this is really sort of plunging the memory. But I've got a feeling it's Edward Woodville. I'm not sure where that's come from. I have no idea. No idea. And it just comes up as an unnamed English nobleman throughout all of the biographies and the different research that I read. Mm. I'm I'm guessing nobody else really searched for this either. I vaguely remember Woodville, but Mm. I couldn't find any backup, so I didn't want to say, yeah, "Yeah, I know what I'm doing. (laughs) No, sorry. A year later, Louis was still in Brittany fighting the French. There are mention in a few sources that many of the Bretons, this is awesome, changed their clothes to the English style to intimidate the French. The French apparently were terribly afraid of English bowmen. Ah, uh, because they'd met them before. 
<laughs> yes. So the Bretons changed their clothes and would carry a bow with them. They didn't know how to use it. So they didn't learn to fire it. <laughs> <laughs> Psychological warfare by wearing a costume. Oh. I thought you were going to say it was like that bloke that we came across in um, Perkins, I don't think, that had the reversible jackets. <laughs> <laughs> York on one side, Lancaster on the other. <laughs> no, no, they actually wore English style clothing and carried bows. I thought that mm. was awesome. Uh, well, so much of war must be psychological, mustn't it? I mean, it's a sport in a way, isn't it? And so, so much of sport is psychological. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't successful. Louis was taken by the French and imprisoned for three years, and not in very nice circumstances. Well, he didn't have to see Jeanne all that time, I suppose, so swings and yeah. roundabouts. Yes. Hmm. And then he and Maximilian both lost Anne of Brittany to Charles. Charles VIII decided the only way to keep this from going out of hand again was to marry him himself. Poor Anne marry had her. no say in any of this, did she? She was just buffeted about... Not at all. Not at all. Mm. After his release, Louis seems to have been reconciled to Charles without any resentment and even became the godfather to Charles and Anne's son. Because it wasn't a love match between Louis and Anne, was it, really? <laughs> I'm not sure. Later on, you will think yes. On mm. Louis's side, yes. Anne's side, not so sure. But she was 10. Yes, but he was very much taken by her. He seemed obsessed with her. This 10-year-old. Yeah, and then I started thinking... I suppose he's seen her grow up. As King John the married first married his wife when she was nine, possibly, if you remember. And he was obsessed with her his entire life to the point where she was a bad advisor for him because he was listening to her. So it seems to be something people did, even though it was disgusting. <laughs> Louis was reconciled to Charles after those three years. Remember, Charles had that boyhood crush that never seems to go away. He idolized Louis. Charles has absolutely no resentment about the fact that he rebelled and even became, got him to be the godfather of his son and asked Louis to become one of his closest advisors and best friends. Charles took Louis with him everywhere and to do everything with him. Very much a bromance. Was that why he was in Italy when Charles yep. invaded? Yes, he took Louis oh, with right. him everywhere. And I do mean everywhere. Well, that... Right. Because I did wonder, because you hear about Charles invading Italy. Yeah. But then Louis was there too. Yes, so thought... the entire time. Okay. Right. 1494. Yeah, that's all. So we are jumping quite a bit. 1494 rolls around and the Prince of Salerno had been urging King Charles to invade Italy. So you were perfect. Perfect timing. The Prince of Salerno? Yes. Well, who's he? I don't know. They don't really oh, right. go into much with him. But he was trying to gain access to certain territories in Italy. He couldn't. We won't go too much into the invasion because... Lucy, you've spoken about it already, but also I have a feeling that's going to need to be something that um, Battle Royale will cover with Charles VIII, because that's all Charles VIII does during his entire reign. He does it over and over again, though, doesn't he, yes. in our podcast? <laughs> yes, but we can sort of understand why. Um, through previous French holdings and intermarriage with the Italian uh rulers. It's easy to see why Charles felt that the regions were his, especially in the case of Milan. Mm. It was... The Pope had told him it was his. And then the Pope had backtracked and said, actually, no, um, I quite, I've decided to like the King of Naples after all. And then yes. Charles said, well, too late, you said yes, it. Yes, but Louis, actually through his mother and the will of her father, owned Milan. He was the ruler of Milan, legally. Hmm. Well, we know the Swartzes weren't. Yes, they took over. Mm. Charles was getting it back for taxes, mostly. Milan was very wealthy. Oh, it was, yeah. They could afford to pay yeah. Leonardo and various others. And legally, if you went through the will and you went through courts and you went through all of the rights of entailment, Louis was the Duke of Milan and should have had it. Hmm. 
Well, you can see why he was so persistent then now. Yes. Here we find another snippet of Henry VII. He had written mm -hmm. to Ludovico called Il Moro. Did you know he was called mm. Il Moro? Meaning the more yeah, for his dark skin? Yeah. We discussed yeah. that because we actually didn't have dark skin. Yes. Somebody commented, one of the people who had painted his portrait commented that it was actually quite pallid. Mm -hmm. So people seem to have assumed, oh, well, he must be Il Moro because of his dark skin. Well, no. <laughs> he had dark hair. He dyed his hair. He had that sort of Berlusconi look. Yes. The other possibility, according to some of the journal articles I read, is he was Moorish in his behavior. And that's why he was called Il Moro. He was considered devious and untrustworthy. And that's what they assumed. Oh, he was that, yes. yes. And that's what they assumed the Moors were like. So it was basically a racial comment. Oh, nice. He was an ex exceptionally devious person. He was. In no way could you trust anything he said. No, and people commented on that. But there was no feeling of, you know, I can't possibly do this. What will people say? No. <laughs> he just uh, thought, I'm going to side with the French now. I'm going yep. to side with the Venetians. I'm going to side with the Turks. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, he didn't care. Fascinating man. Awful. Yes. Henry VII had written to Ludovico, warning him that inviting the French was dangerous, stating that Charles, quote, threatens the Duchy of Milan no less than other principalities near him and advances claim to your duchy for the Duke of Orléans, meaning Louis. Mm. So Henry's actually trying to tell Ludovico, don't do this because the French will take over. Yes. And Ludovico discovered that much, much later, yes. didn't he? Where he suddenly thought, oh, Ooh. Henry was right. Oh, I've made a big mistake here. Now, I didn't know that it was Henry had muscled in at all. No. I didn't come across no, that. No, neither do I. This is one of those reasons why we've said before, you have to study everybody around him to really know what he actually did, because it comes up mm. in their information, not ours. The, number, the amount of stuff that we've come across that we had no idea when we were reading about him. Yes. Initially, nothing. It's in the state papers for Milan. So unless you were mm. studying Milan... It doesn't exist in the state papers for Henry, which is weird because usually what it, what they were supposed to do was there was going to be there were multiple copies. One was kept in the person who sent them in their records and one was kept with the person who received it. And then there were others that were automatically sent to their allies. That's why you see that um, uh, Isabella in one of her episodes, she wrote five letters one went to one person, one went to another person, and then the others were informative to uh, other people that they were allied with. But with mm. Henry, we're finding a lot of them are only in the state papers of who he sent them to. They aren't in his records. Did he just have a very bad filing system or secretary? Or, yeah, or... Or do we think that they were deliberately... Uh, one of the researchers that I read suggested that they were burnt when Richmond Palace caught on fire. Uh, mm. It is a possibility, but we will never know for sure. Hmm. Unfortunately for Henry, Ludovico sent the letter on to Charles. <laughs> That's Ludovico. Yes. In previous readings, we did not hear of Henry being involved at all, but here he is. He was being nice. Henry was being nice. Yes. Warning the Italians against the French prior to the invited invasion, but also really saying I am against the French and the French now have that letter. Mm. Awesome. <laughs> We're also going to wait to cover more of the French-English negotiations for the next several years because we will have to cover those in Charles' episode. Louis is more of a spectator. He was advising Charles, but he wasn't dictating. So I didn't feel like those interactions should be in this episode. And we do have Charles still in our box to pull. To find the threat of Louis again and the English, we jump now to the winter of 1505-1506. Charles VIII has been dead for seven years, and Louis de no. Orléans is now Louis XII le Roi de France. In English, Louis is now Louis XII, King of France. <laughs> Duchess Anne of Brittany duly married Louis, as was required by her original marriage contract after Louis had married had his marriage to Jean Annault. 
So she had to now, is that? Ugh, this is the weird thing. When what? Charles married her, because they had invaded and completely, well, Charles's older sister Anne had invaded the Duchy of Brittany, and to completely negate the threat that that duchy had with the throne of France or to the throne of France, the marriage contract not only required Anne to marry Charles, but to marry his successor regardless of who it was. Oh, poor little thing. Unless <laughs> it was the son of herself, because you couldn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> I'm glad they put that proviso in. That could have been very awkward. Yes, <laughs> thankfully. Like, ew. Yeah, so she had no choice. And because of that contract, that contract demanded now that Louis divorce Jean. So, for him, great. It was a bonus. Mm. Yeah. But why would you do that? Charles knew that Louis was going to be his heir because he never had a son. Wouldn't you have changed that so your sister still remained the Queen of France? Did he like his sister? I don't know. We don't hear anything about that. Maybe he felt resentful towards her because she had been so forceful. That would be Anne. That wouldn't be Jean. Jean was never oh, around. She was not, very yeah. quiet and peaceful. Sorry, I'm getting all muddled up with all these Anne's and Jeans. Yes. But Louis was able to use that contract to annul his marriage to Anne because now he was required by the marriage contract that Charles had made, which was a diplomatic contract, to marry Anne. So he used that to his advantage. But presumably he still had to go to the Pope. Yes, to get it annulled. But now he could say, look, it's, it's out of my hands. I've got to do this. And it's never been consummated. I never touched her. Mm. Don't, yeah, don't listen to her. Don't listen to her. Yeah. There's nobody to object now. He has a legal reason that he needs to. Anne de Beaujau, Beaujau has absolutely no power anymore. So there's nobody to object to the annulment. Mind you, if she, if, if he won't be in the same room as her, it's very unlikely it has been consummated. Yeah, as soon as he could, he was out of her house. He never went near her if he could help it. Mm. Oh, girl. I suppose it's it's a humiliation for him, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we look yeah. at it from that time, he would have seen it as... A, a, an embarrassment. Her is an embarrassment. Yes. Yeah. The poor girl. Mm. Like, what a life. Mm. Isabella and Ferdinand's son has died, Juan, mm -hmm. and Juana was now the heir to Castile. Louis is still in Italy bent on conquest. He wants Milan. Mm. Milan becomes his one and only obsession. But Philip of Burgundy, and he had been developing a relationship, mostly, I think, to do, due to Philip hating his wife and his in-laws than for any diplomatic strategic reason on Philip's side. So they just they got together and had a good old bitch about their wives, did they? <laughs> My wife doesn't Pretty understand much. me. Yeah, her in-laws are awful. Mm. You hate Spain. You're actively fighting them. Louis, by this time, was already suffering with gout, and it was bad. Oh, gout. Yeah, I've just been reading about Lorenzo's yeah. gout. Yeah, the scourge of the nobility <laughs> in this time period. Yes. A... Well, they had a terrible diet. It was almost all meat and no veg. Yeah, although it said Lorenzo's was congenital. He'd inherited it. Ah, okay. I didn't know you could do that, but. Neither did I. No. Is it? No. So congenital isn't inherited. It just means that you're born with it. Mm. Otherwise, it would be genetic. So it's not, but it's not bad diet. Not something diet. Mm. Diet would make it worse, but it wouldn't cause it at that point. I should imagine so. Louis had been proclaimed father of the people right now, or at this time, for his legal reforms, which he did. He did a ton. But again, Battle Royale will mm -hmm. cover that. But legal reforms, reductions of taxes, that was huge, and civil peace within France. And I do not mean in any way to imply that he was peaceful. I just mean that there is no fighting in the country of France itself, like there had been in the previous reigns, which was incessant. He just took them all to Italy. So he's actually been a good king? For France, yes. Hmm. Well, that's his job, isn't it, France? I mean, it's... well, that's quite surprising. Yeah. And he was very careful with his people. 
just not for anybody else. No, well, that's not your job, is it? <laughs> no. So, Philip and Juana must go to Spain. Juana is now the heir to Castile, and mm. Isabella and Ferdinand want her there to prepare her to be the ruler because Isabella is ill. Mm. The treaty in relations with Philip of Burgundy in France means that they would most likely travel through France. Remember, Philip spent time in France as Isabella was ticked off about. Mm. Philip and the friend, French were friends, right? He and Louis liked each other. Mm -hmm. However, Louis was fine with Philip being an archduke. He was not okay with him becoming king of his mortal enemy, Castile. It's an awkward situation, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm. Louis and Ferdinand had now been fighting constantly in Italy for years. Philip mm. would now have half of the Spanish army. Mm. If Philip became king of Castile... France would also now have the same enemy on both the north and south if their relationship should sour. So right and now he's... Philip's son is going to inherit a massive amount of territory that will completely encircle them, won't it? Yes. Mm. This is a terrifying prospect. Right now they're friends with Burgundy. This allows Louis to be in Italy on his campaigns. If Philip changes his mind and starts going after things that Castile believes is theirs against the French, Burgundy would also jump in. So that's Burgundy in the north, Castile in the south, now going after France. Yeah. You may ask what this has to do with England and Henry. Well, Philip, it seems, felt that Louis could not be trusted not to keep Juana and himself as hostages to force a treaty at best, or to obtain a treaty and ransom at worst. Well, it makes a lot of sense, and it does. Henry did just that. <laughs> well, that's just it. <laughs> Philip made the fateful decision, due to his questions on Louis, mm -hmm. to avoid falling into the dubious clutches of the French, they decided to sail through the English Channel to Spain. In January. In January, <laughs> instead of landing in the hands of the French king, they land in the equally devious hands of Henry VII. Mm -hmm. Turns out that Louis could be named the cause of Philip's plight in England with Henry. <laughs> Whoops. Everything's linked. Yep. And that's not just a sort of Tudory type, everything's linked. Everything is linked. <laughs> Everything is totally linked. And it's mm. linked personally rather than diplomatically. That's the interesting thing. Yes. Late 1508 now, Louis was again in Italy and invading Venice. Venice had entered into agreements with the Pope and other rulers without consulting him. In the years prior, Louis and Venice had a strong alliance against Ludovico Sforza, with the mm. opinion in Louis's mind that he would forever after be consulted on any treaty or alliance by Venice. Well, then he has no idea how Italian politics works. Then. No, no, he does not. This you was will not change, the agreement that Venice your remembers. Sides. Yes, you'll change your sides as it suits you. You don't, you don't have to be loyal. Yes, and there is nothing in that agreement that says you're going to be consulted. I see no agreement there. Mm. I see no mention of this there. Venice instead reaches out to Henry VII asking for help with an alliance against the French. And they warned against Louis's attempt to have the French Cardinal was elected as Pope, even though Julius II was still alive and Pope. Yeah, and you don't want to mess with him either. No. He's the warrior Pope. Yes. Hmm. Unfortunately for Venice, Henry could only offer friendship. It was the early 1509 now, and Henry was dying and had no mm. ability to create a force to go into Venice. And he probably wouldn't have done anyway. No. <laughs> Here I think we need to discuss the League of Cambrai. This will make sense of some of the political maneuvers that entwine England and France. The League of Cambrai was part of a response and influence by the Holy League that Lucy told us about in her earlier episode. The League is sometimes referred to as the War of the Holy League, but are not the same thing entirely and confuse things even further as there were multiple Holy Leagues within a very short period of time. Yeah. The first that we covered was formed in 1495. 
This Holy League included Isabella and Ferdinand in cooperation with Pope Alexander VI. Rodrigo Borgia. Yep. They then drew in Maximilian, Venice, and Milan, and tried to bring in Henry. And that was the one where the whole Perkin messed, it was, it upset the whole apple cart with that one. Exactly. Which they were, we'll hear about in Maximilian's episode. Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> forward to that one, actually. That's going to be even more convoluted and full of delusions. <laughs> <laughs> They were initially drawn together to be a force against the Ottoman invasion, but then ended up supposedly. having to battle. Supposedly, mm. yes. But then ended up having to battle the French who had been invited to Italy and began taking over everywhere. Yep, well done, Ludovico. Yes. <laughs> the League of Cambrai was formed in 1508. This was Venetian influence after the Holy League had gained so much more influence over the states in Italy. The Holy League, by invading and taking over, and then Ferdinand and the French fighting over different territories and the King of Naples, and then Spain just keeping those areas, they now had more influence over the northern states of Italy than the Pope liked, and Venice really didn't like. Venice couldn't have independent diplomatic relations with each individual state in Italy now because of the Holy League's influence. It was like a diplomatic conglomeration. Hmm. You may want to trade with Milan, but you can't make an agreement with Milan. You have to make an agreement with everybody else and everybody has different opinions. It was it was stymieing Venice from actually thriving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but... Yes. The Holy League and the constant military wrangling had all but destroyed the power and influence of the specific city-states that were then taken over alternately by the Italians, Sforza, the French, Charles, and then Spain. You never knew who you were having a diplomatic agreement with. So even on top of you trying to get a diplomatic agreement with a single city-state... You'd have an agreement, and then a month later it would be controlled by somebody else, and that agreement would go out the window. And for Venice, the specific problem was that their economics was being affected. Mm. The poor city-states were sitting here thinking it sounded good with the Holy League, but being constantly invaded and plundered as they were the center of a tug-of-war between outside powers. Yes, I mean, the only people in the, I'm just trying to think, the Holy League was largely made up of foreigners, wasn't it? It was almost entirely foreigners. Mm, apart from the Pope. Well, I suppose the Pope was, the Pope was Spanish at that point, but yes. the early one. <laughs> <laughs> um, they also would have nothing to trade, because every time the French came in, they took everything away. Yeah. And then Maximilian would go in, and they'd take everything away. And then Ferdinand would come in, and they'd take everything away. You just mm. start recouping and everything would be taken again. Mm. The Republic of Venice went from being invaded to being a state of strength. They were able to reinforce their walls and actually keep out these invaders. And it was so much so that the Pope Julius decided that they wanted... Venice to be taken down a notch because they were now trying to dictate terms to Pope, the Pope Julius. So Pope Julius joined with Louis, Maximilian, and Ferdinand to push back specifically on Venice's influence and power in northern Italy. That's the League of Cambrai. Venice has recovered from being invaded. Venice has developed a strong economy with Henry VII. And Henry VIII is kind of all over the place. <laughs> okay. Thankfully for Venice, the bickering between Louis and Julius forced the League to collapse in 1510, but not before both Louis and Julius were reaching out to Henry VIII to attempt to gain England for their side of the conflict. So Henry VIII has sort of abandoned Venice, and one thing I couldn't find out is if the alum trade was still continuing. I was just wondering about the alum trade, yes. I think we'll, we'll discover more about that in Pope Julius's episode. 
Yes, Henry VIII was very focused on the French crown. Mm. He was obsessed with being war in war. So I don't know if he continued that trade with Venice. I would say it would be a good thing to do because he needed money. It's what brought the money in. Yes, he'd spent most of his dad's. Yes. So, hmm. Louis, to ensure his hold over Italy would not be lost, because he also did not want to leave back to France, otherwise he would lose Italy, he sent a delegation to Henry VIII. Under the advisement of Wolsey, they entered into a treaty of friendship in 1510. France would send an annual payment to Henry of 50,000 AQ. This is a result. Did, was, was Henry VIII still getting the money that Henry VII was getting, or did that go with no. when Henry VII died? All right. Good question. This is actually a resumption of the payment that he had been making to Henry's father until the death of Charles. When Charles died, Louis stopped those payments. Oh, oh right. Louis that was would have been a big, big wrench because Henry was relying on those. Yes. It was uh, 50,000 AQ a year. Hmm. Louis was also required now to pay the amount owing for the years the payment had not been received. Ooh, back payment. Back That's payment. A nice, nice little lump sum. Unfortunately, Henry VIII was not like his father in being willing to just take money instead of the glory of war. So Louis had to pay another 50,000 AQs to each of Henry's advisors and courtiers to convince Henry to accept. Well, sorry, yeah, no, 50,000 50, AQ was divided among them. So it was another 50,000 on top of it. But yeah, so 50,000 AQs given out to the courtiers to try to convince Henry to accept this instead of going to war with France. Hmm. So I'm going to pay Henry and I'm going to pay everybody around him to make sure I don't have to come to France because I want Milan and I have Milan right now. Perhaps Henry's cat cannier than we thought. Possibly. Or oh, oh, he got lucky. I <laughs> Ah, I think at this point this was still Wolsey and Henry was mm. busy doing the jousting. I think. Why any of the rulers thought that any treaty worked is very strange to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they jumped in and out of them faster than their own clothing. And they mm. changed a lot. <laughs> it was only three years later that Henry VIII signed a treaty with Maximilian and Ferdinand to invade France. And Henry was very eager to go. He was desperate to go, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Mm. Henry may also have been encouraged to invade by his wife, Catherine. She was, after all, Ferdinand's daughter. And she was very much, for some reason, even though her father treated her horribly, mm. encouraging Henry to do whatever Ferdinand said. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. I suppose he probably treated her better than he treated Juana, so she probably thought, oh, I must be the favourites. I don't know. <laughs> Ferdinand didn't treat anybody well. Henry's preparations were already underway, so Louis reached out to Scotland for help. To sweeten the deal, Louis granted every Scot in France the right to own and inherit property and to hold beneficence in France. This was huge. There were a lot of Scots in France, weren't there? Yes, they yeah, have been... I'm trying to remember uh, why. <laughs> they have been part of the old alliance for mm. centuries. The French and the Scottish, for some reason, always came to each other's defense. Because they're on either side of England. You can squash England, can't you? Yes, but mm. France uh, or Scotland also didn't really have anything that France could gain from if they were to invade France, so there had never been an invasion attempt there. Mm. Scotland's not a very rich country at this time they don't have a lot of exports that were making them that wealthy no so they weren't really a target of overthrow except for england because england wanted the entire land mass hmm. so it makes sense that everybody else would be french with scott friends with scotland because scotland could provide them with military aid that was one thing scott scottish highland warriors were very sought after Hmm. They were considered fierce fighters. I was going to say quite sc scary types, I should imagine. Mm -hmm. hmm. The reason that giving the Scottish in France the right to own and inherit property was big was because prior to this, you could only inherit property if you were born in France. 
So if a Scottish person had purchased property in France, when they died, somebody else got that land. It was never given to the family of the Scottish person. Hmm. Changing that meant that they could now buy land and stay in France and their children would inherit that land. It was huge. It was huge for retaining loyalty and to gain more fighters. Mm. Because if they decided to stay in France and they were able to buy property, that property would remain in the family. And that was that was big. Louis also wasted no time in preparing for the invasion from the English. He unleashed his fleet in the Atlantic to hunt down the English fleet, carrying the troops that were going to invade. Lord Howard, All right. this is where he becomes big, <laughs> had left earlier than the Atlantic fleet had been able to fully muster. So the English encountered the French only a few miles off the French coast, rather than before they left English waters. I'll save the description of the sea battle for Lord Howard's episode in season two, because we will be covering him. But the English managed to retain control of the channel because of Lord Howard, which also made it difficult for the Scottish to come over to fight, because now they would have to go through yeah, you English pass ships. Yeah, the same way. Mm -hmm. The English landed in Calais, and it's hard to explain why English desperately needed Calais if you don't think of it this way. Calais was extremely costly for the English to maintain. They yeah. always had to keep a standing army there. They were constantly making improvements to the defenses because the French kept trying to get it. But it's times like these where it becomes critical. They have a city that they control that they don't have to fight to disembark to get onto the continent. Mm. They just step off onto a dock. And if you think about how hard D-Day was, yes. that gives you why maintaining a city on the continent was so critical, regardless of the cost. Mm. I expect it was easier to get to Calais then than it is now because there are 21-hour delays at, at Dover trying to get over to Calais. Really? Hmm. Well, why? Not enough ferries? Brexit. Oh. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Doesn't it just? Brexit doesn't sound like the best idea for the UK. No. At least from outsiders. Outsiders are wondering why it's happening. It does seem a little odd. What we did, you see, we, 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 got us, we got a gun and we put some bullets in and then we took our socks and shoes off and we pointed the gun down <laughs> and fired. And that's proved to be a, a bit of a mistake, really. Oh, uh, yeah. Do that. Mm. But anyway, yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect they had to sit for 21 hours in Dover trying to keep the kids amused. No. Oh, <laughs> in an gosh. overheated car. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> Henry was leading a force of 30,000 English, an additional 20,000 mercenaries that had already gathered in Calais. So when he arrived, he immediately had a 50,000 person military army that was ready mm. to go. July 21st, 1513, Henry and his horde, and I will call it a horde because from what I've read, it was not really well led. I mm -hmm. guess is the best way. The mercenaries sort of did what they wanted. So they were not... Who was, who was ostensibly in charge? Henry. I mean, Henry, I suppose. But I mean, who was, who was actually in charge? <laughs> uh, there were several people, but it seems that the mercenaries were the difficult part. They were almost half their forces, and the mercenaries were very much interested in plundering all the villages and towns rather yeah. than fighting fighting. Well, that's what Perkin found, wasn't it, in... In northern England. Yes. But it was still successful. Yep. Except I can't imagine Henry running back to England in tears. No. <laughs> <laughs> they left Calais. The Horde left Calais and began attacking French fortresses. The French shadowed the English following Louis' orders not to attack. So the French were there. They did not have enough people. Louis was in a bad position. A great number of his forces were in Milan. And he did not want to pull them from Milan. No. When I say he was obsessed with Milan, he was obsessed with Milan. 
But he now had an attack on his western coast, and there were not enough French cavalry to be able to engage the English. He didn't want to pull them out of Milan. The English were delayed as they attacked Terouan, which is southeast of Calais. It was a vast fortress, so large that it could not be surrounded with the 50,000 people I mean, that's without, huge. without badly thinning Henry's lines. Couldn't do it. Because they could not surround it, Louis was able to continue to get supplies to the fortress to withstand the siege. This seems like a miscalculation by Henry, with the possibility of starving the fortress, which was how most fortresses were taken. They were mm. battered down. They waited till they had no food and water, and then people would just open the doors like, okay, we've had enough. The likelihood that they could take it before Louis arrived was very low. Maximilian then arrived with his forces. He actually appears. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Max. Max. He calls himself Maxi when he's writing to his daughter, which is quite oh, endearing. Oh, does he? <laughs> Aw. Maximilian looked at what Henry was doing and basically said, this is stupid. Use all of the men that are in Calais. Bring them out, including non-combatants, to take Terouan. Louis now had time. Terouan had enough provisions to last almost until winter. And if you remember, they landed in June. Louis recalled some of his forces from Milan and brought in others from throughout France. So he started pulling in people that everybody thought he was father of France because nothing was happening in France. Just mm. kind of threw that out the window. Well, Louis you, has... if you're invaded, you're invaded. So you've, got yes. to, you've got to deal with it, haven't you? Yeah, but they could say that the only reason they are invaded is because Louis is going after Milan mm. if he had come back home. But I don't think that would have worked. They still would have fought with French, except instead of being in Milan fighting, they would have been in France fighting a lot sooner. Mm. I just can't see France not having a battle right now with Spain and Maximilian. Louis himself was delayed due to gout. His gout by now was really bad, to the point where he was basically debilitated and in bed for weeks on end. Oh, dear. He did arrive in Amiens, south of Terouan, in August. Then Louis was surprised with the news that the ability for Terouan had bit to hold out had been greatly exaggerated. Though they had been bringing in provisions, they had assumed that they would never be surrounded, so they didn't bring in enough provisions. Hmm. They had only brought in enough provisions for perhaps another month and then assumed they'd be able to continue. But now that Maximilian had arrived and the Calais men had arrived, they were surrounded and could no longer get in provisions. <laughs> so it was a miscalculation hmm. on what they were possibly going to be able to do based on the number in front of them. They didn't think more people were coming. Hmm. So well, a little short-sighted. Yes, that could have uh, huge implications, couldn't it? Yes. Louis immediately dispatched a convoy with supplies, an armed convoy. Henry was personally leading the men to block the resupply convoy, which I didn't realize Henry VIII was personally leading troops at this point. I knew he was there, but I thought it would be more like later on in his life where he is kept separate and out of the battle. Hmm. Man, he was so keen to show his chivalric... True. Uh, credentials, didn't he? Yes. He probably he insisted. Very, very focused on glory. Mm. I want glory. The French were still under strict orders not to engage the English. And this is not a mistake on Louis' side. They didn't have close to the men. They had maybe a quarter of the men. And they didn't have cavalry. The English did. Cavalry will just wipe out infantry. It it just happens. Pikemen mm -hmm. will slow them down. But really, for cavalry, you need cavalry and you need archers. And the archers, which is so unfortunate, the archers don't aim for the men on top no, of the horses. They don't. They aim for the horses. Because once you get somebody, a knight on horseback on foot, they're basically a turtle. Yes, I was just thinking that. Yeah. yeah. The armor is so heavy. We really do need to get a military, a medieval military 
expert on here because every time I go into it, I was like, I never thought of that. It never occurred to me that once you take out the horses, mm. they cannot fight the same way. The armor is so heavy and they can't walk that they can't move fast enough to actually defend themselves. Or to run away. <laughs> or to run away, yeah. yes. That's another thing I didn't know. Did you know that cavalry always brought... Well, if they could afford it, they would bring four or five horses because the horses would be killed from up, from underneath them. You always hear about so-and-so fighting and the two two or three horses were killed underneath them. Yeah. Think, and this is why, because yeah. the archers would go after the horses. Mm. Yeah, it, it's just, it's very much a weird strategy. Everything you do. Yes. Why bring something <laughs> that's, that's so easily killable? Yes. And it they did have some armor for horses, but the mm. chain link could be easily penetrated by an English longbow. This chain link isn't that strong. It's gr great for long cuts or long swords. When a long sword hits the metal, the metal stops it. But it's punctures that go through chain link, and which take is the why... And take the chain in with it as well. Yes. So it, it's just, I found it fascinating. Looking okay. at, well, it made me start looking at board games for military conquest. And you see that cavalry has plus marks for infantry, but minus marks or minus points in defense for archery. And then you look at the archers and the archers pretty much have no defense whatsoever, mm. but they have exceptional long range points. And yeah. I start seeing where that came in. Sorry, that was a weird aside, but that's where my brain went. <laughs> so back to the French still being under strict orders not to engage the English. Do not, no matter what, do not engage the English. And the French convoy came face to face with the English and Henry, who were already in battle formation. They had somehow under spies found out that the convoy was coming and the convoy thought that they were still secret. The convoy captains immediately, because of those orders, ordered a retreat. And I don't mean a slow retreat. I mean... Mm -hmm. Run away. Run away. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Monty Python, run away, <laughs> run away. They were not fast enough, and the English archers began pelting the French force with volleys of arrows. The orderly retreat that started as just turn around and flee became an all-out scramble in every direction. The French cavalry were pursued, and 120 high-ranking Frenchmen were taken hostage. A 120. Mm. That's a huge amount. The skirmish became famous. Do you know this one? No. As the Battle of the Spurs. All right. Because do you, get, do you get to keep the spurs of the person you've captured? It was the fact that the French were kicking their horses so hard to try to run. They just turned and ran. They didn't attempt to run, or they didn't attempt to fight. Not only did they not attempt to fight, because we say skirmish, only 40, 40 or so men were killed on the French side, which isn't a lot. But the French cavalrymen were dropping everything in their attempt to get away. They dropped their battle standards, their lances, and even started peeling off their armor to reduce the weight to make their horses go faster. You wouldn't have thought you could get armor off that quickly. I mean, you would need a squire so. to get it on, don't you? Either that or you're cutting the leather straps. Hmm. Whilst, armor, whilst riding on a horse. Whilst riding on a horse. Mm. But it, it's, it was mentioned that they were even dropping their armor to try to gain more speed. Mm. But and then I started thinking, well, if they were doing that, they would have been faster. So how did they not get away? The French were already charging. The French so had cavalry to had to turn, turn mm. and get their horses going. And it was fairly muddy. So the horses were struggling to get running. So they were caught. The failed resupply of Tarawan was fatal to that fortress. It surrendered the next week, and Henry and Maximilian had it torn down entirely. They took apart it, took it apart brick by brick. Absolutely nothing was left. No walls. They took the weapons, everything, gone. When I was reading about it and going back and forth between Maximilian and Henry, and then looking in at what the 
agreements were between Henry and Maximilian in the end, I started feeling this was more not because it was strategic to remove it so that they didn't have it in, behind them. Because if they had occupied it, they would now have yet another resupply fortress. Hmm. It seemed more that they could not agree on who would going to keep it. Yes, that sounds plausible. Henry demanded it was him. Maximilian said absolutely not. It was me. You wouldn't have taken it if I hadn't told you to bring in the Calais men from Calais to surround it. And it's they're definitely hardly going to share it, are they? <laughs> and they're not going to share it. So somebody got in between them and said, look, we'll tear it down. We'll just tear it down. It won't be a fortress anymore. It won't be a strategic value in any way, shape, or form. And then it doesn't matter who has it. And that's what they did. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Louis did not have enough forces at hand to even attempt to save Tournai. This is the next village, uh, next, right. sorry, the next fortress that was the most common thing or the most strategic thing that Maximilian and Henry could do. And, of course, that's where they went. That one changed hands a lot, though, didn't it? It didn't know whether it was French or Burgundian. Or... Yes, but it was also very wealthy mm. and it was a fairly strong forest, fortress. <laughs> um, seeing that Maximilian and Henry are heading there Louis got there first but discovered there was no way he had enough fortresses, forces at hand to save the fortress to save Ternay so instead he abandons the city and just tells them to remain loyal hmm. that's easier said than done <laughs> yes Especially since there's some debate that Louis took some of their men-at-arms with him when he left. So he left them with even fewer people to defend the town. Did it fall? <laughs> yeah. Well, like smart people, they did not decide to defend it all. You had just taken a bunch of our, male, our men. You took some of our weapons. We, we are left with nothing. So instead, they offered generous terms to Henry, who got there before Maximilian. But Henry was out for glory. So they they weren't st weren't doing this together. Still, they were just racing each other from one place to another. It seems like they were racing each other. Mm. Yes, they were both heading to Tournai, but Henry got there first. <laughs> Henry refused to accept the offer, <laughs> and decided to start bombarding the fortress. His dad would have taken the money. Yes, <laughs> taken the money, gone home, and gone on to do something more sensible. I wonder if Henry was like, you know what? I really want to use my cannons. I yeah. like cannons. Let's use the cannons. Maximilian arrived and reigned in Henry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Maximilian reigning in somebody. Yes. You know that you're completely, well, I was going to say a loose cannon, if um, Maximilian's saying, no, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> just, yeah. just slow down and think. Yes. Mm. We need all of our armaments to go after Louis, and you're wasting them on Tournai, especially since they offered... So Tournai again offered to surrender to Maximilian this time. But Henry, like an obstinate teenager, demands that, no, you cannot surrender to Maximilian. You need to surrender to me because I'm the rightful king of France. Hmm. Not sure. No one, not, yeah, I don't know if anyone's told Louis that uh, Henry is the rightful king of France. No. Louis was now in serious trouble. He had most of his forces still in Italy. He had refused to pull all of them out to defend his home, his home country. Earlier, Louis had managed to take Burgundy. I didn't really mention it because it doesn't have anything to do with English at that time. But now, another of Louis's armies had to remain in Burgundy to defend against the Swiss. So the military that he had pulled from Milan to defend against England now had to stop and defend Burgundy because Louis had ticked off the Swiss king. And the, the Swiss had a, a lot of, they provided mercenaries for the rest of the Europe, didn't they? So they were quite good fighters. Yes, they did. Somewhere along the lines, Switzerland had demanded that Louis give up Milan to them because a lot of their mercenary forces had taken Milan. And Louis said no. Well, you can understand it. I mean, he has, as he would see it, a an actual right to it, whereas they just use force. Yes. Mm. Yes. And they used force under his expense. <laughs> he was paying for it. Why do you want it? There's a lot more in Switzerland's claim to Milan, but you can, we're just talking about Louis's point of view, which is, no, it's mm. fine. This is where Maximilian steps in. Mm -hmm. 
Maximilian convinces Switzerland that if you want Louis out of Milan, attack Burgundy. Because Louis has to keep Burgundy. Maximilian Otherwise is saying attack Burgundy. To the Swiss, yeah. But his, his well, his grand, grandson, presumably it is now, is yep. the ruler of Burgundy. Yes. Attack my but grandson. Fran- no. Louis, I didn't mention it earlier, but Louis had taken Burgundy. Right. So Louis is in control of Burgundy. So Maximilian convinced the, Swiss, the Swiss right, okay. to take God, back this is so Burgundy. Confusing. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes. It really is. It is. You almost need a board mm. in front of you and move colored pieces around to see who owns it. Remember that map that we had at the very mm. beginning showing exactly how much of England is controlled? If you keep playing that map, because it's a YouTube video of the countries constantly changing, you will see just how chaotic it is. My goodness. Mm. This is owned by French, then Maximilian, then back to Burgundy, then back to Swiss, and and it's all over that area. So, Maximilian was able to do this. That August, the Swiss made their move and invaded Burgundy. Louis now has three active war fronts in France itself. Plus Milan. As well, plus Milan. The only thing that saves Louis here is Maximilian. Sorry, Lucy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're going to cover this gaffe, but Maximilian had promised the Swiss that he would come to aid them to take Paris after they occupied Burgundy. Hang on a second. Say that sentence again. <laughs> <laughs> in return for the Swiss taking Burgundy back yep. from yep. Louis, he promised that when they moved on to take Paris, Maximilian would arrive to help them take Paris. Right. Okay. Okay. Maximilian didn't do it. The Swiss managed to take Dijon, but because they were so angry with Maximilian for not holding up his end of the bargain, because the bargain was that they were going to get to keep Paris, but they can't keep it if they don't have it. Mm. They entered into terms with one of Louis's ministers, La Tremoy. Louis was to give the Swiss... Milan and Asti. So he's giving up Milan, finally. He's giving up Milan after all that. Just wait. And pay the Swiss 400,000 AQ if they would leave France and Burgundy. The Swiss left. So now he only has England and the Holy Roman Empire attacking him. Louis did not agree to the treaty. He wasn't the one that signed it. Right. So he waited for the Swiss to leave France before he told them that there's no way he's giving them Milan. They can have Asti. I'm not giving you Milan. Right. So it did, I, I thought, yeah, I thought he'd be crazy to give up Milan after all that. Yes, I <laughs> hadn't t- seen the implications of that. <laughs> yes. Yep. But he had strategically waited too late in the season for the Swiss to return with an army and to set up for winter before he told them. So I'm going to wait until there's no possibility of you coming back this year. I should think the Swiss are quite hardy. I I think they could probably manage it. I'm Mm. not sure. It has to do with supply convoys. There was a very specific time where armies would be able to bring enough food for their military in order to maintain Mm. an invasion. And this is now way too late for them to be able to do it. That's why when, because when Henry went into France, it was November, I seem to remember. So it did imply that mm. he actually had no intention of spending much of time in France and fighting and thing. No. Mm. And when we wonder why this is such a crucial thing, countries at this time would mandate a certain amount of food and supplies for military use and for the government. And any of the excess was allowed to be sold. So if you were trying to do it later, you didn't have that. You would have to buy it Mm. back. And nobody had the money to really buy back supplies for an entire invasion to work it through the winter. It just, it wasn't economically feasible. So again, we're back to Mm. economics dictating war. Queen Anne, Louis's wife, had also been busy negotiating, so this is Anne of Brittany, with negotiating with Ferdinand and Maximilian ignoring England. 
a marriage contract with the French Dauphine, René, and Ferdinand's grandson, Ferdinand. So Anne is saying, if we can stop this, you can, your son, Ferdinand, or your grandson, Ferdinand, can marry a French princess. What is Ferdinand? Is he anything? He's a younger son, so he's only a duke. Yeah, he's the younger son of Philip. Yes, younger grandson. Yeah, I was just wondering what his status was. I can't mm. remember. I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. But marrying a princess is well beyond what he technically should mm. have been slated for, for status. So this was a big thing for Ferdinand. During the negotiations, Anne dies. And this is where we find out that Louis actually did love her. He mourned her deeply. He insisted that the entire country wear black, mm. which wasn't Done for queens. Expensive for lots of people as well. Yes, and for a lot longer. He refused to attend things for months and months and months afterwards. He was deeply affected. He actually went into seclusion for a well, while. That's no good. He's being, he's being uh, bombarded on two Attacked. sides. You can't, you can't just step away. Hmm. It didn't help. It did not help him. She had successfully mended bridges between Louis and the Pope, now Leo X, Julius II is oh. gone, and had built the road for a treaty between Maximilian and Ferdinand with Louis. Henry was completely left out of the negotiations by any and all parties. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is where Henry was not happy. Henry was not drawn into the negotiations until the next year in 1514, when only when Louis was being pressured to remarry and produce a son, Maximilian and Ferdinand had agreed to split up their holdings in France between them and completely exclude Henry. Henry didn't get Terouanne, he didn't get Tournai, he didn't get to be king of France. No, mm. no, and this there is quite a bit of mention that this is when Henry turns against Catherine. She stops being an advisor because she was the one pushing for him to do what Ferdinand said, and then Ferdinand turned against him. Right. It is suggested that this is the initial break in Catherine and Henry's relationship. She never again advises him in any sort of military or diplomatic. She is excluded and put back down to just what the queen is allowed to work on. Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Mm -hmm. So it might have nothing to do with him, well, only partly to do with him loving Anne Boleyn. I presume he fell in love with Anne Boleyn because he was out of love with Catherine. And he was out of love with her because she'd messed up and ruined it for him. It started here. Mm. It seems the treatment of her starts going downhill from here, yes. So Louis now needs a new bride because he still doesn't have a son. He and Anne had many daughters, but no sons. Right. Well, I think I can see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> there are three possible wives on the horizon for Louis. No, this would make sound like bachelorette number one. <laughs> bachelorette number one. <laughs> Queen Margaret of Scotland, Henry's sister, his eldest sister. Mm. Her husband, King James of Scotland, had died at the Battle of Flodden. But it wasn't Henry who killed him. James had invaded northern England. And it was Queen Catherine's forces that took out James. Mm, don't suppose she got brownie points for that, though, did she? <laughs> yes. she. If I remember correctly, she wanted to send him the King of Scots body, but the English faint hearts weren't up to it, oh, and he yeah. got a bloody cloak instead. <laughs> Yes, but, I mean, it's a long journey. It is. Could you imagine you, the stench? I mean, that's, yes, that's not going to be nice once he, once it arrives. You say, oh, what's my... Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, we pickled him first. <laughs> the death of King James means that Margaret, Henry's eldest sister, is now available to be married again. Mm -hmm. She is put forward as a possible marriage for Louis. But because she is Queen Margaret of Scotland now... For some reason, and I'm not sure how this works, instead of her brother having the right to say whether or not she should, could be remarried, she is the property of the Scottish crown because she has a son who is now king. So she becomes the property of her son rather than Henry. Mm. Women, even as queens, if we just look at Maximilian's daughter, Margaret, 
She gets married and passed around quite a bit, and her father determines every single one of her marriages because she does never have a son. Mm. But as soon as you have a son and the son is king, you become basically a ward of your own son, which is really weird to me. Your son gets to decide if you remarry. I thought you were going to say that Henry VIII refused to allow the uh, marriage between Margaret and Louis because they're either side of him. So you don't really want to have you know, make the Scottish and the French uh, liaison even stronger. Yes. One of the reasons why Margaret was considered a good risk is because she'd already had a son, which means she's possible of having sons. She's, she's proven herself. It is bizarre, isn't it, this idea that, uh, oh, no, you can only have girls, but this one has shown yes. she can have a boy. You... And now we know it's the men that get to decide it. Well, <laughs> men and diet, apparently, and stress. Hmm. But anyway, she has proven herself to be able to produce a boy, but there isn't really a strategic hmm. link for this marriage. There's no reason. Scotland and France are already very much united. It doesn't benefit them with any sort of economic bonus either because Scotland doesn't have a lot of money. No. So they wouldn't be able to provide a very good dowry. So she is rejected, not because of herself. Nothing. She was rejected before as well, wasn't she, with the first marriage? <laughs> I know. James didn't want her either. <laughs> Welcome, Bachelorette number two. And then we've got Mary Tudor, Henry's younger sister. Mm. No, I think she's the youngest. I can't remember. I think so. Oh, because like, other... another one died, didn't she? When she yes. was young. Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah, she died. So many people died. So who was the third option? And now, Bachelorette number three. The third is Margaret of Austria, Maximilian's daughter. All right. Margaret of Austria, however, was vehemently anti-French. She's also anti-marriage, isn't she? She is by now, yes. Mm. I can totally understand why she's vehemently anti-French. She was originally slated to marry Charles VIII of France, so much so that she was sent from Maximilian's court to France court to be... When she was two. When she was two, <laughs> to be raised by Charles's family with Charles. Mm. Charles repudiates her and marries Anne of Brittany instead and then refuses to give her up so that Maximilian can continue to pay the French court for her upkeep. Then she's finally kicked out of France because she's no longer wanted and she gets married to Juan. Juan mm. and her were very much in love and that also helped solidify her distaste for the French because Spain was so anti-French. Mm. So she refuses. Oh, no, absolutely not. I will not even consider the marriage. How dare you even bring it up to me? And there was a mention in a letter that she actually started throwing things at the, the envoys that mentioned it to her. So, Well, yeah. if she's not going to marry Henry, she's not going to marry Louis, really, is she? No, no, no. Absolutely no, Perhaps not. Louis didn't send her any pictures of the little fingers and everything. <laughs> we know she's not impressed by that. No. Because Margaret doesn't bring in any economic value and Maximilian's daughter said absolutely not, Louis is then told to consider Mary Tudor. There are a couple of bonuses to this. One, she'd be able to provide a very handsome dowry because England is fairly wealthy at this time. Henry is one of the richest monarchs because of what his father had gathered mm. for him and he hadn't spent it all yet. <laughs> and she's young. There's a lot of uh, breeding time in her. Yes, 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 yes. So which would he choose? <laughs> Margaret, a widow who was 25 with only a few more years of childbearing in front of her with absolutely no money, or Mary, a virgin who was 18, just entering the prime of her childbearing years and could bring in hundreds of thousands of crowns in a dowry. Hmm. Henry, Henry VIII, was enraged still with Ferdinand and Maximilian because of them ah. divvying up their holdings. So this is a nice little way of getting back at them. Exactly. They had excluded him from negotiations, and he felt that he needed to get back. Henry turned his back on them and negotiated with Louis. So much so that they were going to take back the holdings from Mar Maximilian and Ferdinand and would divvy it up between Henry VIII and Louis. Ferdinand 
gets wind of this, gets scared, and offers his eldest granddaughter to Louis as another possible bride with a gigantic dowry. Don't listen to him, Louis. He's not going to pay it. No. (laughs) Not only that, Louis was promised that Ferdinand would pull out of Italy if he Mm. didn't marry Mary Tudor, which, of course, he wouldn't have done anyway. (laughs) Keep in mind, Louis is 52. Mm. There's a big age difference between them, isn't there? Yes. Louis was still on the possible fight with Ferdinand, Maximilian, and Switzerland is now angry with him as well because he didn't follow through and give them Milan and he didn't... She didn't say he was going to do. Yeah, it was one of his... Yeah, but his advisor had signed the treaty and he was... You had given him a permission to do the diplomacy part, so why didn't you follow through? He should have said to him, okay, these are the parameters. Do not offer Milan... Yeah. (laughs) Ferdinand and Maximilian are pretty much out of it. Louis knew that you couldn't trust Ferdinand and Maximilian as sort of fly-by-night kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So he turns to Henry. But Henry's demands for peace and the bride for Louis were high. And remember, Louis desperately needs peace because he still has to go back to Milan. (laughs) And he's still obsessed with Milan, so he needs peace in France. Henry demands that Louis concede that Terrawan, Tournai, and St. Quentin are all cities that were taken the previous year are now English territories. And that Louis provide England 1,500,000 ducats. That's a whacking great amount, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, Louis's not impressed. (laughs) They do finally manage to hammer out an agreement. Henry VIII would get Terrawan and Tournai. Haven't they put it in Terrawan they've pulled down? They did, but the city is still there and it's still of economic value. Okay. But he would only get 1 million crowns instead of 1 million 500, 1.5 million ducats. Now, I can't tell you the value difference. I went down yet another rabbit hole to find out that there are a ton of different ducats, mm. all of different value, <laughs> which I didn't realize. And talk about confusing. So Venice had a gold ducat. Mm. Hungary had a debased gold ducat. Then Austria had a gold ducat that may have been the purest ducat and so more valuable. Then there were silver ducats that were even less valuable. And in this treaty, it is not digitized, so I couldn't see what is specified, but it was likely to be the more valuable ducat of Hungary than the crowns. So he was getting half a million less, and then he was getting it in a much lower value of money. Henry was also to pay a dowry of 400,000 crowns for Mary. Henry demanded that half of that would be jewels and clothing. And one thing to clarify here is jewels and clothing stayed with the woman. All right. So he's Mm. really only getting 200,000 crowns for Mary. Mm. The rest of it, if he dies or anything happens, comes back to England with Mary. Mm -hmm. He has learned something off his dad then. Yes, he has. Mm -hmm. The other thing with that is it guarantees Mary something in case Louis mishandles the rest of the money that normally would go back to her. So her dowry Mm. was really supposed to maintain a woman after she, her husband died, if she wasn't remarried by her father or her eldest brother. Yeah, because we know that they can sometimes be quite badly treated once, once the husband's gone, can't they? Yes, very much so. Uh, I'd hate, I don't think I'd like to be a woman at this time. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Louis was also required to give Mary properties in France worth 700,000 ducats that would be hers for life regardless of her status or where she was living. She was a lot younger than her, and Henry actually did care a great deal for his sister. This was his favorite sister. So he was ensuring that after Poor she... Margaret. She's not even the favorite sister. Yeah, I know. She's <laughs> not even her favorite of her brother. Yeah. He was ensuring that no matter what happened, she would be well provided for, mm. which a lot of kings didn't. We look at She did the say other... she didn't want to do it, didn't she? She said to him, I'll only do this if next time round, and there will be a next time because he's an old man, I can yeah. choose my partner, even though yeah. Henry then said later, I don't remember that conversation. <laughs> we never had that conversation. Yeah. So maybe she was able to negotiate for herself and say, look, I will do it, but. But. Mm. Here is the rules. So you perhaps if Margaret, yes. Margaret of Austria had uh, taken that line, she could have 
Well, yes. she did all right, didn't she? Yes. She is 34 years younger than Louis, so you would need to provide for pretty much her entire lifetime. Mm. Because you don't think he's going to last that long. I do want to tell people, please do not think of the marriage in the TV su- series, The Tudors. For one, they kept saying it was Margaret. And it's not. It's Mary. She <laughs> marries the king. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, they made the king a great deal older <laughs> than he actually is. He's only 52. And the actor they have playing him in the Tudor series looks like he's in his 60s or 70s. I've never watched the Tudors, and I probably never will. Oh, everything I hear it's... about it just annoys me. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Mm. It is not good. I I was very disappointed in it. Like, even the clothing. You look at the picture that they have on as the DVD or whatever, on Blu-ray and on Netflix. Mm. They're not even wearing Tudor clothing. What the heck are they wearing? What is that? They would never be caught dead in that. She's mm-hmm. basically in like a nightgown oh, in right. the picture. Mm. Yes. Total bull. Absolute bull. Okay. Louis was ecstatic. Mary was reported to be weeping bitterly at this prospect. (laughs) He was ecstatic. Mary was considered the most beautiful woman in Europe by everybody. She's clever. She's funny. She's intelligent. And he just won her as a bride. His portrait actually shows a pretty healthy man, but by his own diplomats, he was being described as being riddled with gout. Yeah, now that is incredibly debilitating, isn't it? I don't know much about it. I know how painful it is and that it affects your lower limbs. Mm. It's sort of crystalline. Something gets in your joints or your blood, isn't it? Nasty. Yeah. And your feet can totally swell up to the point where you can't walk. Mm. You can't get out of bed. I'm just wondering. I mean, he's getting a young one so that he can sire a son. Yes. He's in such pain in his lower Lower regions. Yeah. Can he? Would he? Will he? Might he? I don't know. <laughs> he obviously feels that he's up to it because mm. he starts beginning planning his reconquest of Milan. Or perhaps Margaret Beaufort can give him a few casks of her, her little uh, tipple of Malvasy. <laughs> her painkillers. <laughs> Drink this, you'll be fine. <laughs> Louis goes out and asks Charles Brandon, the Duke of Suffolk, to help him secure a loan from Henry of 200,000 ecus for that reconquest. So he obviously feels he's up to it. Hmm. So we'll find out in the next season what Charles Brandon's doing out there. Yes. (laughs) Let's not get in there. (laughs) Mary was sent to France with a large entourage that included a 13-year-old Anne of Boleyn. Mm. So she comes with her to France. Louis, who by custom and etiquette was not to see his bride until she was formally received, pulled a Henry VII with Catherine of Aragon. He rode out pretending to be hunting Mm. and just happened to run across her on her way to the reception. I didn't know you were coming this way. (laughs) He then broke etiquette and protocol again by kissing her on the mouth. In England... Not a big deal. That's what you do in England. You kiss Mm. people on the mouth. Men, women, doesn't matter. I know this seems so odd to people in England now, but this was well known in England. (laughs) And we know what um, what to put a stop to that, but um, we don't need to talk about it. No, no. (laughs) But yes, he kisses her on the mouth, and this was considered so scandalous. Well, maybe he was, you know, when in Rome, you know, she's English, this is what she'll expect. Or he just thought she was so hot, he needed to get a kiss in. Because she was beautiful. That evening, this is awesome. So they meet, they have the reception, and that evening a fire broke out in the town. But it had been ordered that absolutely no bells be rung to avoid disturbing the king at his party. And they followed this so much so that the town burnt to the ground because they did not (laughs) ring the fire bell. I'm not sure if that would have made the town happy that Mary had showed up. Mm. To show a bit of initiative. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on. On October 9th, 1514, the marriage was consummated and Mary was crowned in Paris on November the 3rd. Crowned in Paris on November the 3rd. Crowned on Paris. <laughs> well, this one, there's no, there's nobody saying, yes, we did. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. No, we didn't. They both say, yes, we did. <laughs> mm. right. We'll come to that. All right. Oh, yeah. The pageantry was 
beyond decadent. And apparently that pageant of God being above the city, Mm. he was hung up there by ropes. I'm not sure I'd feel safe, (laughs) but there was no actual wooden structure. You would think it would be a wooden tower and he'd Mm. be standing above it. No, they had him dangling by ropes Mm. from something. I'm just thinking, I was wondering about what all the people whose houses are just burnt down are thinking of this pageant. Well, they're in a different town. All right. That was the reception where they officially welcomed her to France. They then moved on to Paris for the marriage and for the festivities. Mary was crowned in Paris November 3rd, and the festivities lasted for 23 days. <sighs> God, that sounds just, that sounds tiresome, really, doesn't it? You just think, oh, I yes. just want to do something else. We've got parties, tournaments. It's basically a gigantic circus for the entire town. Mm. Louis gave Mary a great deal of jewels. And I do mean a great deal of jewels, which then caused a controversy. The French claimed, when Louis passed away, that they were crown jewels. And they still went with Mary back to England. And this confused me. Who cares? They were given to Mary. Well... Another rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I discovered, and well, I didn't discover. I learned. Somebody Mm -hmm. else already knew it. But for a queen, there are two, possibly three sets of jewels. Didn't know that. This is the same for both France and England. Probably elsewhere as well, but due to time constraints, I didn't look very much further on this. First, the crown jewels. These are not owned by the state in any way. No, really? State has no claim to them. They aren't even owned by the monarch. Another confusing thing. Mm -hmm. These are jewels that are held in trust by the monarchy for the monarchy. What this means is that the queen has use of the jewels but can't sell them. Right. They are then passed to the next queen when the king dies. Immediately. The dowager gets use of some of them and they are set aside as dowager queen jewels. But they still do not get to be given away. They have to go to the next queen. State can't sell them. The monarchy can't sell them. They are just constantly held jewels. They're not allowed to be touched. They probably found that was the only way to stop people when you're desperate for money, melting them down. Yes. The only thing that can be done with those crown jewels is alteration. So you can change the settings, but you cannot reduce the amount of gold. Mm. For the settings, you cannot reduce the amount of jewels. You can increase them and state that they are part of the crown jewels, but you can't reduce them. Louis had given a bunch of jewels that he had purchased to Mary, but the French were saying because of the amount of money that they should have been crown jewels, Mary took them back to England with her anyway. (laughs) No, they're not. They were given to me. The next are the personal jewels of the queen. These are jewels that she brought with her into marriage or gifts from anyone. That was slated to be a personal gift. It was supposed to be stated at the time that they are a personal gift. These become hers entirely. She could dispose of them in any way she liked. The possible third, which was interesting, are state-owned jewels. So these are outside of the crown jewels. These are jewels that are purchased for a queen or a king that can be given to royalty as a personal gift, which then end up outside of the state-owned jewels, so they can be passed down to non-crown queens. So, for example, a queen has the crown jewels, which automatically go to the next queen. Hmm. These state jewels then would be divvied up amongst the princesses. Hmm. Like It's really confusing. Hmm. I I get the economics of it and why you'd want to do that, but... Really, they're not supposed to be given outside of the royal family. So they still remain with the royal family, but they're owned by the royal family, but they have rules attached to them. It it really was convoluted. And that third one is a possible. There is some debate on whether or not that was still the case at this time. It's proved to be the case in previous eras. Mm. But I couldn't find anything saying it was still the case during this period. Mm. Louis was so pleased with his wife that he provided pensions for Cardinal Wolsey for arranging the marriage and then for Charles Brandon for bringing his bride safely to him. Oh, so that's probably what they lived on later then. Yes, that's what I was thinking. (laughs) 
Louis and Mary, their, shall we call it, excess in loving, was the talk of the court. According to the memoirs of Robert Florange III, Marshal de Florange, which is Robert Florange's, he's the third marshal of Florange, he did memoirs, which were fantastic. They go for a very long time. There's 11 volumes, and I was just reading the first volume because that's around this time. The jesters were joking that Henry had sent Louis in bacone. That's a word that no longer exists. Hmm. Took me quite a while to find answer to that. It could be called a rental filly or a filly for hire. That doesn't sound good. No, because they figured... And this is what he says. Frederick Baumgartner, he's a historian, translated the rest of this because it was very confusing the way it's written because it's all um, slang. It was to quote, Philly for hire, to carry him off quickly and most sweetly to hell or paradise. End quote. Hmm. So we'll give him a young Philly that's very active that will kill him fast. <laughs> And it pretty much came true. Louis' health failed incredibly rapidly after he married Mary. They wed October 8th of 1514, and Louis died that January 1515. Well, that's... Three months. She did quite well out of that, didn't she? Yes, <laughs> she did. <laughs> she just had a grit of teeth for three months. <laughs> I don't know, she might, have, she might have loved him. We also don't oh. know if she had to grit her teeth for three months. He had a severe case of gout to the point where he was bedridden, and there was speculation that due to how bad his gout was, there was no way they could have consummated. Mary had been asked and had confirmed that he had performed after the wedding night and that the marriage had been consummated. Historian Baumgartner, he states that Louis also bragged that, quote, thrice did he cross the river last night and would have done more had he chosen, end quote. Which I think is gross. Yeah. Like, come on, just say yes and leave it at that. It's all very well Arthur saying something like that, but he was 14. Yes. yes, but at the same time, you're thinking he's so happy, he's virile. You can kind of mm. see him doing it too. But we will never know for sure if it, if his gout, which was in the fatal stages, would have prevented the consummation. But Mary was required to remain in France for several months until it was proven that she was not carrying the French air. Mm. And that is the end of Louis, dying of a debilitating disease at the end. Yeah, the pretty, yeah, pretty nasty one. Mm -hmm. No painkillers, and it's no apparently incredibly painful. Yes, they don't even have laudanum yet. No. But on to reading him. All right, yeah, interesting man. Mm hmm. And we did. We left out so much. There mm. is a lot on Louis, and I'm hoping Ben will be able to go much deeper into that for Battle Royale's episode on him. At least I've done some of his bibliography for him. <laughs> <laughs> you can send him your list. <laughs> I've also kept the PDF files for him. <laughs> Amphiboly. Amphiboly. This is our entry ground. How devious were they? Louis spent the majority of his younger life attempting to stay on the good side of the spider. But when Charles became king, he did rebel. Mm. But he seems to be more rebelling against the regency of Charles's older sister, Anne, rather than Charles. And after Charles... Yeah, and without knowing anything about Anne, we don't know how justified he was in doing that, really. No. And after he was king, he... He did not intrigue in any way that affected England. He was more a war hammer rather than mm. a schemer. He didn't, his diplomacy and what I could see didn't really scheme. He was just, yeah, I'm going to come get it. So I'm not mm. sure if we can really go with much for intrigue here. And unless you're considering military strategy as a type of intrigue. Well, I suppose it is, isn't it? I mean, it is how you're going to one up have, have one upmanship on your opponents yes very true but that's it he was very successful in northern italy he did fairly well in france considering he had absolutely no military and he did tell the swiss or let the swiss think that he was accepting that did the swiss come back i didn't continue because that's outside of his lifetime mm. if they did 
Right. Okay. Well, he won that one. Yes, then, he didn't did. Because he? <laughs> he died before they came back. But was that deceit or was that just, I'm just not going to tell them until there's no possibility of them coming back? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that makes that makes so much more sense, doesn't it? Yes, it, it? does. I mean, you don't wait until they're two miles down the road and then shout, shout at them, by the way, I'm not going to give, it, <laughs> give you Milan. You think, let's let them get on a bit. Yep. Um, oh, gosh, this is... I think it's very difficult. Me too. Because some of them are so obviously schemey. Yes. Hmm. I might take the easy option and go to down the middle. I wasn't even going to... When in doubt, go down the middle. <laughs> I wasn't even going to do that because I didn't find anything... Specifically, if we look at England, they were very blunt. Hmm. There was nothing hidden whatsoever. Yeah, true. So hmm. I was only going to give him a one for his All right. trying to deceive England during the military strategy. That was it. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's difficult. Yes, everyone's scheming around him. And he's just saying bluntly, this is what I'm doing. No, I think you're right. Yeah, I'll go, yeah, I'll go the same. Okay, so that's a two for Amphibolian Intrigue. Antiperistasis. Antiperistasis. This is Rise and Fall. Did they climb or plummet? Again, kind of difficult to nail down. He was born a duke. Mm -hmm. He was part of the royal line. He was third in line when he was born. Yeah, he just got to the place he was meant to be, really, didn't he? Yes, pretty much. Well... Sort of. He did go up a bit, and only because Louis's younger, or the spider's younger brother and his son passed away. So hmm. two people had to die. They didn't kill him. Um, no, he didn't. He lost it all when he rebelled against Charles. They actually took away all of his stuff and put him in prison for three years. But hmm. then he... Yeah, so I was thinking it's, it's not a, a straight line from being heir to the throne to getting the throne. Well, it's, I suppose, being heir to the throne, but being... Being in line to the throne and getting the throne wasn't a straight yes. line. There was a big dip. But you could say that he went down with his wife because his first wife was a princess. His second wife was a duchess. Hmm. It's very awkward to say he got anywhere. Yeah, it seems an odd thing to say for a king. Yes. I mean, he's, <laughs> got to go, he's got to have gone up because he didn't start as a king and he's now a king. And the fact he went down... And then came up again, meant he was actually coming up from the point where he was in prison. Yes. After the... Um, rebellion. Oh, rebellion, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's not going to be huge because that's that's his, that was his trajectory in the first place. Yes. All he had to do was wait for two people to die. And one of them was not healthy. Mm. So you could almost assume it was going to happen. Yeah, the other one, but the other one had a nasty accident. So, well, not even a nasty accident. He just had an accident. Yes. <laughs> it seems hard to, to give someone a low score when they end up being king. Yes. But I'm thinking four. Four? I was thinking a six because he sort of maintained, mm. but then got a slight blip up at the end. Yeah. Five. Okay, so that's 11 for antiperistasis. Martyrdom. Martyrdom. How far were they willing to go? Honestly, zero. He fled every time he was losing. He fled when he lost against Charles and then was captured and taken prisoner. He fled when there were a couple of instances in Milan where it was dangerous, so he actually left the, the field of battle. In England, he didn't lead his troops in any way so we can't really say he took yeah, risks even henry did mm -hmm. yeah no i think you're right i can't think of anything you've read a lot more about him than i have and when england invaded can't. france he gave strict orders not to attack until he had all of his forces ready so he wasn't even reckless there although that was more smart military strategy mm. yeah i don't think martyrdom is recklessness necessarily no. was it? Not, and he was very quick to sign treaties to stay out of that battle with in France. Hmm. No, can't think of anything. So zero? I think so. Yeah, I agree. Zero for martyrdom. B-team. B-team. This is our posterity round. 
What did they leave behind that still resonates today? He left a lot of death and destruction in Italy. Yep. But if we're looking at France, he reduced the taxes and provided a civil peace within the country that lasted most of his reign. He was no longer at war with Burgundy or Brittany. Mm -hmm. Or England. Or England, yeah. For his subjects, he really must have been seen as a godsend. Especially after the spider. Yes. And all the mad war that went around the, the Regency. Yeah. And even the one war that did show up, he ended the war very quickly with a treaty with England, which also stopped fighting with France and or Spain and the Holy Roman Empire for a little while. Mm. I mean, his contemporary subjects adored him. But he, we do need to speak about the fact that he's lost. When you research him, it was a little like researching Henry VII. Every time I tried to Google him or even search him in the mm -hmm. academic journals, it kept offering me the universal spider or mm. Louis XIV. It, it was really difficult to find people who were interested in him and what he did. And I didn't find anything saying that he had set up some sort of benevolent or even educational thing. I wouldn't have had time by the sound of it. Yeah, that was, that was the answer to my other question was going to be, um, what what do the French think about him now? I mean, the, he's their history, really. But if you had trouble finding... Yeah. Yeah. Even the research that I did find, if I you know, scroll back, we're looking at old stuff. And it's even the old stuff is reprints, like Pomp and Circumstances, Pageantry Politics, and Propaganda in France during the reign of Louis XII. It was printed in 1978, but it was going back and referring to documents that happened in the 1600s. It really was not very helpful. It's not something people are looking. 1960, 1967, 1972, and these are all reprints of discussions that happened earlier. So it would be a bit like asking an English person, how much do you know about Henry VII? Yes, I think it would be exactly the same. Yeah. People would say, he's Henry VIII, Dad. And that's it. Yes, one of the best runs was Procedures and Politics during the reign of Henry XII, which is actually in French and was written in 1885. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the better sources. So I don't think we can give him much, much really, if he's not up there, really, is he? I don't know if the Italians no. remember him bitterly. Probably not. Probably not. Well, they might. I don't know. Very little. I mean, two. He's a king. He'd be on the list of kings if someone did a Rex Factor of... Well, if, if someone did a Rex Factor of the French monarchs, <laughs> 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 they will have to cover him. Yes. Maybe they will find more. I will give him a two as well, because I mm. like that, because there will be a Rex Factor on him when... Battle Royale gets to him. When I said that, I was thinking about in France, and then I suddenly thought, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ben and Eliza. Flaunt a bleeding flaunt. Flaunt a flaunt. This is our portraiture round. This is the portrait that Mary was given for their marriage. Yeah, I have seen him before. It's a very malleable face, isn't it? Yes, and he doesn't look old. No, he doesn't. He hasn't gone grey. I'm going to show you the other portrait, which is... He's wearing the thing, a bit like uh, Perkin was wearing, the sort of um, Thunderbird's hat. Mm -hmm. With his badge on it. He's got some, yeah, something round his neck, which I can't quite see. Is that... I'm not sure what the black medallion... Uh, you can see the collar or the strands. Mm. I don't even know what you would call that. The actual necklace part of the black medallion that he wore underneath his clothing. I didn't get an explanation of what he is wearing underneath his clothing. Over top... He's got little fingers. He does have little fingers. They're not creeping over the top, over the, the no. frame, but... No, and he has a very decadent gold medallion collar, and then mm. the brocade that he's wearing. A lot of brocade. Mm. And that's gold thread that he's wearing. Yeah. Gold embroidered brocade. We also have a picture when he's younger, which is not very flattering. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, who painted that? That's terrible. I don't know. Terrible. It's got the same little badge thing on, but 
He seems to have mumps or some some toothache. He's yep. all swelled up at the side. And he is very cross-eyed. Incredibly. Very cross-eyed. Yeah, his which eyes isn't are, in the other picture. His eyes are looking in two completely different directions. He's got one side of his face is really, really red, and the other side is really, really pale. Yes, either this is painted by somebody who's never actually painted anything before in their lives, or the other one is extremely flattering and he was <laughs> cross-eyed. <laughs> but you can see what I mean about him not having a tiny head. He looks like he has tiny shoulders. No, no, he's got normal size head. Yes. Yes, it's quite a sort of uh, décolleté off the shoulder number he's wearing. Yes, there, it isn't looks it? like it's going to fall off. His bra, his bra strap showing. Uh, yes, an interesting picture. I like that picture. You can see that it says Père de Purple. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, really, but for Bettine, he should have got points for for being the father of the people. But maybe that's what his two points were. Yeah. But perhaps he called himself the father of the people. So in which case, no, he was declared later the father of the people, uh, and during his reign. Well, perhaps like Charles II, maybe the number of mistresses he had, he was father of most of them. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I can't tell what's on his collar. It looks like a seashell and then little scissors, but I don't think those are scissors. No, they look like shrimps. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I like that picture. I'm going to give him an extra point because I like that picture because it's so unflattering. <laughs> it's very unflattering. <laughs> uh, it's still the same hat's. He did yes. the same choice in hats, Thunderbird hat. Yeah, and you can see that this one was painted on wood rather than on a canvas. Oh, yes, you can see the lines. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing there to say, to tell us anything about him, really, apart from that he may have been cross-eyed, but he may not have been. Yeah, there's nothing. So I like the picture. I'm going to give him three. Okay. Because I like that picture of him being cross-eyed, but I can't see. There's nothing. There's no symbolism. Nothing. No. I found it fairly boring. Same with the other one. I found it fairly boring. There's nothing in the background. The detail on the clothing in the first picture when he's older is very nice. Mm. Mm. And that one's much more flattering with the eyes. He doesn't look cross-eyed. No, he looks bored. He looks bored. He's obviously been sitting there for a while, hasn't yeah. he? I'm going to give a four just because of the detail in the clothing. I think the yeah. artist did a gorgeous job in rendering what he would have worn. Yeah, that's a good picture. Mm -hmm. I'm not... Yes, it is a good picture. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Oh, another, another 3.5. Yeah. Now, oh. the big question. Well, hang on. Oh. How much has he got? Oh, not very uh, much. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> not very much the, at all. Out of the total. 13, 15, 18.5. Yes. Yeah, not very Ooh. much. Oh, dear. No. Hmm. Ooh. He's one of our lowest. Yes. Well, he made it above John de la Pole, the second Duke of Suff Suffolk. <laughs> that's good. And, oh, he beats out Arthur Tudor, the Prince of Wales, but that's not saying much for his long life. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover no, all of it. And he did a hell of a lot. Yes, he did. He did an awful lot. If Battle Royale manages to do that in one episode his whole life, I don't know how they're going to do that. There, he did so much, so much. But yes. But if you're asking the question, is he or isn't he? Are they too delicious or what? No. No, not for me no. either. No. Sorry, Louis. We, we were looking at too delicious in your actions with England, and basically all you did with England was get smacked around a bit and then marry somebody pretty. <laughs> Smacked around by Henry the Eighth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Who had, really hadn't got a clue what he was doing. Nope. Nope. <sighs> Sorry, Lou. I, I mean, I'm not even sure where he's failing, really, because he's he was so busy. He was very busy, but he was busy busy in Italy. Now, if it had been yeah. an Italian, probably would have said yes for how much he took over. He would have been incredibly significant, but for England. Not much. Yeah, but did they want him to take over? Mind you, they said they were stuck with the Sforzas, so perhaps yes. they did want him to take over. Yeah. Yeah. No. Sorry, Louis. No. Nope. It's a no from no. me. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who is my next Ooh, one? Please next pull one. the next one. Oh, 
This one looks tricky. Okay. And I'm slightly glad I haven't got this one because it looks like a lot of work. Pedro de Ayala, ah, Spanish ambassador. ambassador to Scotland. Okay. At least to Scotland. I don't know if he's ambassador to anywhere else, but yes. we came across him in Scotland. He and de Puebla become sort of rival ambassadors in England with Catherine oh, of Aragon. Right. Hmm. They become a sort of comedy duo, don't they, really? Yes, they do. Both failing. <laughs> hmm. Oh, well. Yep. Yeah, Good. what I might Good. do with them is use him, if I can't find enough on him, I can use him as sort of a, this is how diplomacy and diplomats worked. Because we haven't mm. had a lot of a discussion about what the ambassadors were doing and how they traveled and why they were sent to various places. No, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. A good insight into yes. their lives. Yes, especially since he moves from court to court. I know he goes to three different courts at one point in his life. Hmm. I don't know. We'll no. find out. I don't know that much about him. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I came across him, but yeah. Yeah, that'll be There's a so, good one. So many names. Yes. Mm. Good. got a ton of names. Yay. <laughs> so that's my next one. And to your next one. And that's the end of our episode on Louis the Twelfth. We hope you've enjoyed it and will join us for the next episode on Maximilian, Maximilian or... The Malus Maleficarum. Ah. Not sure. Not sure which comes next. Yes. It's hard to think about what's coming up in the future when we haven't done it yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> be one of those. It'll be one of those. <laughs> yeah. And if it's not one, the, the, if it's not one, the, that one will be coming afterwards. Yes. Thank you for listening. You can find details of the podcast and contact us on... And in the meantime, should not in this best garden of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage? The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. The one in Motley here, the other found out there. Goodbye. Goodbye. Let's go.
Lord. Will you please answer the question, my Lord? Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife or not? You have to take out all the meows that you can hear in the background. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> I might leave them in and you telling it to go away. <sighs> Let me in, Mom. Shut up. <laughs> She's persistent. She gets the back doors open. She's got a cat flap. Oh, but she wants she to meows the at window. the front door. If she meows at the front door, someone will let her in. But no, 